The Great Hunt by Robert Jordan Read by Mark Rolston The man who called himself Bors, at least in this place, sneered at the low murmuring that rolled around the vaulted chamber like the soft gabble of geese. His grimace was hidden by the black silk mask that covered his face. It was just like the masks that covered the hundred other faces in the chamber. If one did not look too closely, the huge room could have been in a palace, with its tall marble fireplaces and its golden lamps hanging from the dome ceiling. If one did not look too closely, the fireplaces were cold, for one thing. Flames danced on logs as thick as a man's leg, but gave no heat. The walls behind the tapestries were undressed stone, almost black. There were no windows, and only two doorways, one at either end of the room. It was as if someone had intended to give the semblance of a palace reception chamber. Where the chamber was, the man who called himself Bors, did not know, nor did he think any of the others knew. He did not like to think about where it might be. It was enough that he had been summoned. He shifted his cloak, thankful that the fires were cold, else it would have been too hot for the black wool draping him to the floor. All his clothes were black. The bulky folds of the cloak hid the stoop he used to disguise his height. Silently, he watched his companions. Patience had marked much of his life. Always, if he waited and watched long enough, someone made a mistake. Most of the others here might have the same philosophy. They watched and listened to those who had to speak. Some could not bear waiting or silence, and so gave away more than they knew. Servants circulated through the guests. Slender, golden-haired youths proffering wine with a bow and a wordless smile. Young men and young women alike, they wore tight white breeches and flowing white shirts. Each looked more than a mirror image of the others. The boys as handsome as the girls were beautiful. Frowning behind his mask, he studied his companions. There was weakness there. Their nervousness betrayed them. Even those who had sense enough to guard their tongues. A stiffness in the way this one held himself a jerkiness in the way that one handled her skirts. A good quarter of them, he estimated, had not bothered with the disguise beyond the masks. Their clothes told much. A woman in gray was standing before a gold and crimson wall hanging. She had obviously chosen the spot because the colors of the tapestry set off her garb, doubly foolish to draw attention to herself, for her scarlet dress marked her from Ilion and a woman of wealth, perhaps even of noble blood. Not far beyond the Iliana, another woman stood, alone and admirably silent. With a swan's neck and lustrous black hair, she kept her back to the stone wall, observing everything. No nervousness there, only serene self-possession. Very admirable, that, but her coppery skin and her creamy high neck gown marked her of the first blood of Aradoman and unless he missed his guess entirely, the wide golden bracelet on her left wrist bore her house symbols. A man in a high-collared, sky-blue Shinaran coat passed him. The man's carriage named him a soldier. The man who called himself Bor snorted as the Shinaran moved on. He could read them all. Suddenly his eyes narrowed, fixing on a woman enveloped in black till nothing showed but her fingers. On her right hand rested a gold ring in the shape of a serpent eating its own tail. Aes Sedai. Or at least a woman trained in Tarvalon by Aes Sedai. No one else would wear that ring. Almost immediately he spotted another woman swathed from head to toe in black and wearing a great serpent ring. The two witches gave no sign that they knew each other. In the white tower they sat like spiders in the middle of a web, pulling the strings that made kings and queens dance, meddling. Curse them all to death eternal. A chime sounded. 
a single shivering note that came from everywhere at once and cut off all other sounds. The tall doors at the far end of the chamber swung open, and two trollocks stepped into the room, spikes decorating the black mail that hung to their knees. Everyone shied back. Head and shoulders taller than the tallest man there, the Trollocs were a stomach-turning blend of man and animal, human faces twisted and altered. One had a heavy pointed beak where his mouth and nose should have been, and feathers covered his head instead of hair. The other walked on hooves, his face pushed out in a hairy muzzle, and goat horns stuck up above his ears. Ignoring the humans, the Trollocs turned back toward the door and bowed, servile and cringing. The feathers on the one lifted in a tight crest. A mere drowl stepped between them, and they fell to their knees. It was garbed in black, garments that hung still without a ripple as it moved with a viper's grace. The man who called himself Bors felt his lips drawing back over his teeth, half snarl and half fear. It had its face uncovered. Its pasty pale face, a man's face, but eyeless as an egg, like a maggot in a grave. A smooth white face swiveled, regarding them all one by one. A visible shiver ran through them under that eyeless look. The masked ones tried to press back into the crowd, milling to avoid that gaze. The Mirdral's look shaped them into a semicircle facing the door. The man who called himself Bors swallowed. There will come a day, half-man, when the great Lord of the Dark comes again, he will choose his new dread lords, and you will cower before them, you will cower before men, before me. The mere drowl's voice rasped. Your master comes. To your bellies, worms. Grovel, lest his brilliance blind and burn you. Rage filled the man who called himself Bors, at the tone as much as the words, but then the air above the half-man shimmered, and the import drove home. The Trollocs were already on their bellies, writhing as if they wanted to burrow into the floor. Without waiting to see if anyone else moved, the man who called himself Bors dropped face down, grunting as he bruised himself on the stone. On their bellies, the assembled intoned a creed. The great Lord of the Dark is my master, and most heartily do I serve him to the last shred of my very soul. Lo, my master is death's master. Asking nothing do I serve against the day of his coming, yet do I serve in the sure and certain hope of life everlasting. Surely the faithful shall be exalted in the land, exalted above the unbelievers, exalted above thrones, yet do I serve humbly against the day of his return. Swift come the day of return, swift come the great lord of the dark to guide us and rule the world for ever and ever. Rise, all of you, rise! The mellifluous voice took him by surprise. The figure of a man floated in the air above the mere drow, the hem of his blood-red robe hanging a span over the half-man's head. Would the great Lord of the Dark appear to them as a man, and masked besides? One of the forsaken, perhaps. The day of the Dark One's return must be close at hand if one of the forsaken was free. The forsaken, thirteen of the most powerful wielders of the One Power had been sealed up in Shaogul along with the Dark One, sealed away from the world of men by the dragon and the hundred companions, and the backblast of that sealing had tainted the male half of the true source. And all the male Aes Sedai, those cursed wielders of the power, went mad and broke the world, tore it apart like a pottery bowl smashed on rocks, ending the age of legends before they died, rotting while they still lived. A fitting death for Aes Sedai to his mind. Too good for them. He regretted only that the women had been spared. The red-masked figure gestured with both hands for all to rise. Those gesturing hands were horribly burned, the raw flesh between them as red as the figure's robes. When all were on their feet, the floating figure spoke. 
I have been known by many names. But the one by which you shall know me is Baal Zamon. The man who called himself Bors clamped his teeth to keep them from chattering. Baal Zamon. In the Trolloc tongue it meant Heart of the Dark, the Trolloc name for the Great Lord of the Dark, he whose name must not be uttered. Not the true name, Shaitan, but still forbidden. To sully either name with a human tongue was blasphemy. The servants were gone, and the Trollocs as well, though he had not seen them go. Balsamon spoke. The place where you stand lies in the shadow of Shaol Gol. Fear not, for the day of your master's rising upon the world is near at hand. The day of return draws nigh. Soon the wheel of time will be broken. Soon the great serpent will die, and your master will remake the world in his own image for all ages to come. And those who serve me, faithful and steadfast, will sit at my feet and rule the world of men forever. So have I promised, and so shall it be, without end. You shall live and rule forever. A murmur of anticipation ran through the listeners, their eyes lifted, rapturous. Even the man who called himself Bors felt the pull of that promise, the promise for which he had dealt away his soul a hundred times over. Balsamon said, The day of return comes closer, but there is much yet to do. The air to Balsamon's left shimmered and thickened, and the figure of a young man hung there, a country lad by his clothes, with a light of mischief in his brown eyes and the hint of a smile on his lips. The flesh looked warm, but the chest did not move with breath. The eyes did not blink. The air to Balsamon's right wavered as if with heat, and a second country-clad figure hung suspended a little below Balsamon, a curly-haired youth as heavily muscled as a blacksmith. A battle-axe hung at his side, a great steel half-moon balanced by a thick spike. The man who called himself Bors suddenly leaned forward, intent on even greater strangeness, a youth with yellow eyes. For the third time air solidified into the shape of a young man, this time directly under Balsamon's feet. A tall fellow with eyes grey-blue and dark reddish hair. Another villager or farmer. The man who called himself Bors gasped. A sword swung from the figure's belt, a sword with a bronze heron on the scabbard, and another inset into the long two-handled hilt. Balsamon spoke. There is now one who walks the world, one who was and will be, but is not yet, the dragon reborn. The dragon must be turned to my service. Better he serve me, and serve me he must and will. These three you must know, for each is a thread in the pattern I mean to weave, and it will be up to you to see that they are placed as I command. One by one the gathering received their orders. The man who called himself Bors jerked as his name was called out. Bors, firstly you are to return to Tarabon and continue your good works. In fact, I command you to redouble your efforts. Secondly, you will watch for the three young men and have your followers watch. Be warned, they are dangerous. Thirdly, regarding those who have landed at Toman Head and the Domani, of this you will speak to no one when you return to Tarabon. The man who called himself Bors realized as he listened that his mouth was sagging open. The instructions made no sense, he thought to himself. If I knew what some of the others were told, perhaps I could piece it together. Abruptly he felt his head grasped as though by a giant hand crushing his temples, felt himself being lifted, and the world blew apart in a thousand starbursts, each flash of light becoming an image that fled across his mind. Hesitantly he straightened. Balsamon rebuked him. Some commands are too important to be known by even he who carries them out. Bors bent almost double in his bow. As you command, great lord, so shall it be. When he straightened, he was alone in silence once more. 
He turned his attention to the three figures hanging suspended before Balzamon's floating form. The muscular, curly-haired youth, the farmer with the sword, and the lad with a look of mischief on his face. In his mind, the man who called himself Bors had named them the blacksmith, the swordsman, and the trickster. What is their place in the puzzle, he thought. They must be important, or Balzamon would not have made them the center of this gathering. But from his orders alone they could all die at any time. And he had to think that some of the others gathered had orders as deadly for the three. He stared at the blacksmith. Blue eyes could meet the nobility of Andor. Unlikely in those clothes, but yellow eyes. Who are they? What are they? He started at a touch on his arm, and looked round to find one of the white-clad servants, a young man, standing by his side. The others were back, too, more than before, one for each of the masked. He blinked. Bowsamon was gone. The Mirdra was gone, too. The three figures still hung there, though. He felt as if they were staring at him. If it please you, my lord Bors, I will show you to your room. Bors did not feel at all comfortable until he was back in the room where he had waited on first arriving. Even finding the seals on his saddlebags untouched was small comfort. The servant stood in the hallway, not entering. You may change to your own garments if you wish, my lord. None will see you depart here, nor arrive at your destination. But it may be best to arrive already properly clothed. Someone will come soon to show you the way. Untouched by any visible hand, the door swung shut. The man who called himself Bors shivered in spite of himself. Hastily he undid the seals and buckles of his saddlebags and pulled out his usual cloak. In the back of his mind a small voice wondered if the promised power, even the immortality, was worth another meeting like this. But he laughed to himself. For that much power... I would praise the great Lord of the Dark under the Dome of Truth. Remembering the commands given him by Alzamon, he fingered the golden flaring sun worked on the breast of the white cloak. A red shepherd's crook behind the sun was the symbol of his office in the world of men. There was work, great work to be done in Tarabon, and on Almoth Plain. The Wheel of Time Turns and ages come and pass, leaving memories that become legend, then fade to myth, and are long forgot when that age comes again. In one age, called the Third Age by some, an age yet to come, an age long past, a wind rose in the mountains of doom. The wind was not the beginning. There are neither beginnings nor endings to the turning of the wheel of time, but it was a beginning. The wind blew south across the tangled forest of the Great Blight, a forest tainted and twisted by the touch of the Dark One. The sickly sweet smell of corruption faded by the time the wind crossed the invisible line men called the border of Shinar, where spring flowers hung thick in the trees. It should have been summer by now, but spring had been late in coming, and the land had run wild to catch up. New pale green bristled on every bush, and red new growth tipped every tree branch. The wind rippled farmers' fields, solid with crops that almost seemed to creep upward visibly. The smell of death was all but gone long before the wind reached the stone-walled town of Faldara on its hills, but it whipped around a tower of the fortress, in the very center of the town. Hard-walled and high, Faldara both keep and town, never taken, never betrayed. The wind moaned across the wood-shingled rooftops, around tall stone chimneys and taller towers, moaned like a dirge. Stripped to the waist, Rand Al Thor shivered at the wind's cold caress, and his fingers flexed on the long hilt of the practice sword he held, the hot sun had slicked his chest, and his dark reddish hair clung to his head in a sweat-curled mat. He strove to keep his mind empty, but the other man sharing the tower top with him kept intruding on the emptiness. Ten paces across the tower top was, 
big enough and more not to feel crowded except when shared with the warder. Young as he was, Rand was taller than most men, but the warder, Lan, stood just as tall and more heavily muscled, if not quite so broad in the shoulders. A narrow band of braided leather held the warder's long hair back from his face, a face that seemed made from stony planes and angles, a face unlined, as if to belie the tinge of grey at his temples. Despite the heat and exertion, only a light coat of sweat glistened on his chest and arms. Rand searched Lan's icy blue eyes, hunting for some hint of what the other man intended. The warder never seemed to blink, and the practice sword in his hands moved surely and smoothly as he flowed from one stance to another. With a bundle of thin, loosely bound staves in place of a blade, the practice sword would make a loud clack when it struck anything, and leave a welt where it hit flesh. Ran knew all too well. Three thin red lines stung on his ribs, and another burned his shoulder. It had taken all his efforts not to wear more. Lan bore not a mark. As he had been taught, Ran formed a single flame in his mind and concentrated on it. He tried to feed all emotion and passion into it to form a void within himself. Emptiness came. As was too often the case of late, it was not a perfect emptiness. The flame still remained, or some sense of light sending ripples through the stillness, but it was enough, barely. The cool peace of the void crept over him, and he was one with the practice sword, with the smooth stones under his boots, even with Lan. All was one, and he moved without thought in a rhythm that matched the waters, step for step, and move for move. For a long minute the clack-clack-clack of bundled lathes meeting filled the tower-top. Ran made no effort to reach the other man. It was all he could do to keep the water's strikes from reaching him. Turning Lan's blows at the last possible moment, he was forced back. Lan's expression never changed. The practice sword seemed alive in his hands. Abruptly, the water's swinging slash changed in mid-motion to a thrust. Caught by surprise, ran step back, already wincing with the blow he knew he could not stop this time. The lathes of Lan's practice sword were sharp points oozing toward his heart, jagged lathes piercing his skin. Pain lanced through Rand's body. His whole skin felt slashed. With a shout, he threw himself, stumbling back, falling against the stone wall. Hand trembling, he touched the gashes on his chest and raised bloody fingers before his grey eyes in disbelief. Lan grated. And what was that fool move, Shepherder? You know better by now or should unless you have forgotten everything I've tried to teach you. Ran's mouth was dry. The wind, it pushed me, somehow it pushed me, solid as a wall. Strange things can happen this close to the blight, Lan said finally. But for all the flatness of the words he sounded troubled. That in itself was strange. Warders, those half-legendary warriors who served the Ace of Die, seldom showed emotion. He tossed the scattered lathe sword aside and leaned against the wall where their real swords lay. How long before you leave, Shepherder? A month since you said you were going, and I thought you'd be three weeks gone by now. Rand set down the practice sword and lifted his real sword to his knees. He ran his fingers along the long, leather-wrapped hilt inset with a bronzed heron. Another bronze heron stood on the scabbard, and yet another was scribed on the sheathed blade. It was still a little strange to him that he had a sword, much less one with the blade master's mark. He was a farmer from the two rivers, so far away now. He was a shepherd like his father, and his father had given him a heron-marked sword. Tam is my father, no matter what anybody says, Ran thought. He wished his thought did not sound as if he was trying to convince himself. Lan seemed to read his mind. In the borderlands, Shepherder, if a man has the raising of a child, that child is his, and none can say different. Scowling, Ran ignored the warder's words. It was no one's business but his own. I want to learn how to use this. I need to. 
It had caused him problems carrying a heron mark sword. Not everybody knew what it meant or even noticed it, but even so, a heron mark blade, especially in the hands of a youth barely old enough to be called a man, still attracted the wrong sort of attention. I've been able to bluff sometimes when I could not run, and I've been lucky, but what happens when I can't run, and I can't bluff, and my luck runs out? You could sell it. That blade is rare enough even among Heron Mark swords. You could fetch a pretty price. It was an idea Rand had thought of more than once, but he rejected it now for the same reason he always had, and more fiercely for coming from someone else. As long as I keep it, he thought, I have the right to call Tam father. It was the sword of the kings of Malkir. Land did not speak of it. Rand did not even like others to speak of it. But Alan Mandragoran was the lord of the Seven Towers, lord of the lakes, and uncrowned king of Malkir. The Seven Towers were broken now, and the Thousand Lakes the lair of unclean things. Malkir laid swallowed by the great blight, and of all the Malkiri lords, only one still lived. Lan. Some said Lan had become a warder, bonding himself to Moiraine and Ace Sedai, so he could seek death in the blight and join the rest of his blood. Rand had indeed seen Lan put himself in harm's way, seemingly without regard for his own safety, but far beyond his own life and safety he held those of Moiraine who held his bond. Rand did not think Lan would truly seek death while Moiraine lived. Turning his blade in the light, Lan spoke. In the War of the Shadow, the One Power itself was used as a weapon. And weapons were made with the One Power. Some weapons used the One Power, things that could destroy an entire city at one blow, lay waste to the land for leagues. Just as well, those were all lost in the breaking. Those weapons the Aes Sedai made, and there will never be others. When it was done, war and age ended together, with the world shattered. The Aes Sedai, who still lived, swore they would never again make a weapon for one man to kill another. But there were simpler weapons, too, for those who would face Myrdral, and worse things the dread lords made. One of those swords, a plain soldier's sword, became something more, marked as it was with a heron. Rand's hands jerked away from the sword propped on his knees. It toppled, and instinctively he grabbed it before it hit the floor stones. You mean Ace Sedai made this? I, I thought you were talking about your sword. Not all Heronmark blades are Ace Sedai work. Few men handle a sword with the skill to be named Blade Master and be awarded a Heronmark blade. But even so, not enough Ace Sedai blades remain for more than a handful to have one. Most come from master bladesmiths, the finest steel men can make, yet still wrought by man's hands. But that one, sheep herder. That one could tell a tale of three thousand years and more. Rand thought to himself, Tam gave it to me. My father gave it to me. He refused to think of how a two-river shepherd had come by a heron mark blade. Do you really want to get away, sheep herder? Why are you not gone, then? The sword? In five years I could make you worthy of it, make you a blade master, but I do not have five years to give over to teaching you, and you do not have five years for learning, so why are you still here? Rand mumbled, Matt and Perrin are still here. I don't want to leave before they do. Blood and ashes, at least they just think I'm crazy not to go home with them. Half the time Nine of looks at me like I'm six years old and I've skinned my knee. The other half she looks like she's seeing a stranger. She's a wisdom. And besides that, I don't think she's ever been afraid of anything. And Egwene, burn me. She knows why I have to go. But every time I mention it, she looks at me and I nod up inside. I mean, sometimes I wish... Land said... You wish the girl would go with you instead of to Tarvalin. You think she'll give up becoming an ace to die for a life of wandering with you? If you put it to her in the right way, she might. Love is an odd thing. He could not do that to her, but light, wouldn't it be sweet just for a minute if she said she wanted to? Rand wished Egwene were back home in Emmons Field, but all hope of that had gone the day Moiraine came to the two rivers. And that is all the reason, Shepherder. You want to spend as much time as you can with your friends from home before they go. That's why you're dragging your feet. Rand surged angrily to his feet. All right, it's Moiraine. I wouldn't even be here if not for her. 
She tells me horrible things about myself that I'm going to go mad and die. From the south came a faint peal of trumpets, a rolling fanfare slowly growing louder, accompanied by the steady beat of drums. For a moment Rand and Lan stared at each other. Then the drums drew them to the tower wall to stare southward. The warder said nothing, his eyes intent on the column emerging from the forest. Mounted men in armor rode out of the trees, and women on horseback too. Then a pallet borne by horses, one before and one behind, its curtains down. Like a singing serpent, the column wound its way toward Faldara. The wind flapped its banner, the flame of Tarvalon. Rand was amazed at all those women out there. So many Aes died together. Why so many, Lan? The water was expressionless, saying only, The Amrillan seats come in person. Your lessons are done, Shepherder. Better for you if you were a week gone. With that, the water snatched up his shirt and disappeared down the ladder into the tower. Rand stared at the column approaching Faldara as if it were a snake. The Amrillan seat who ordered the Aes to die. She's come because of me, he thought. He could think of no other reason. He whispered, I didn't mean to channel the power. It was an accident. Light, I don't want anything to do with it. I swear I'll never touch it again. I swear it. The halls of Faldara Keep bustled with the news of the Amrillan seat's imminent arrival. Servants in black and gold darted about their tasks. Ran dashed to the men's apartments, darted into the room he shared with Matt and Perrin. He froze, his jaw dropping in astonishment. The room was filled with women clearing out his clothes, and Matt's and Perrin's, out of the wardrobe and replacing them with new. The housekeeper addressed him. Moirene Sedai said all your clothes are worn out, and the Lady Amalisa had new made to give you. Just keep out of our way and we'll be done the quicker. There were few men the housekeeper could not bully into doing as she wished. Some said even Lord Agomar himself. There was no time for arguing. The Amrillan seat could be sending for him at any minute. When Rand finished changing into the new finery, he pulled open the firebox door and took out a bundle. Inside nestled two hard leather cases. The larger held a harp. The other, long and slim, contained the gold and silver flute he had used to earn his supper for more than once since leaving home. Tom Marilyn had taught him to play that flute before the Greenman died. Rand could never touch it without remembering Tom shoving the bundle into his hands and shouting for him to run. And then Tom had run himself, knives appearing magically as if he were performing to face the mere draw that was coming to kill them. With a shiver he redid the bundle. It was past time for him to be gone from Faldara. Rand went to each gate one by one, but each was guarded and the word was given that no one was to leave the keep on orders of the Amrillan seat. Down deep corridors he went, opening the storeroom door from which came the sound of voices. The rattle of dice came through their soft murmurs. Loyal was watching them dice. Augur were not exactly common in the borderlands, but they were known and accepted here. And Loyal had been in Faldar long enough to excite little comment. The Augur's dark tunic was buttoned up to his neck and flared below the waist over his high boots. One of the big pockets bulged with the weight of something. Books, if Rand knew him. Even watching men gamble, Loyal would not be far from a book. In spite of everything, Rand found himself grinning. Loyal often had that effect on him. Loyal's tufted ears and eyebrows dangled like long mustaches, and his nose was almost as wide as his face. When the augur saw it was Rand, his face split into a grin. Ah, there you are. At the same time, two of the dices rose from the game, Matt and Perrin. Matt had a dagger with a ruby in its hilt. It was a tainted blade from the dead city of Shadolagoth, tainted and twisted by an evil almost as bad as the Dark One. That taint would kill Matt if he kept the dagger. It would kill him even faster if he put it aside. Matt asked, Where'd you get those clothes? Moiraine well, had all our clothes replaced. That doesn't matter. I just need to get out of here. The Amrillan seat is here, and Lan said it would be better if I were gone a week. I need to leave, and all the gates are barred. Perrin's eyes lifted, yellow eyes gleaming in the dim light like burnished gold. 
Perrin's eyes had been as deep a brown as Matt's when they left the two rivers. Rand had no idea how the change had come about. Perrin did not want to talk about it. It had come at the same time as the slump now in his shoulders. Perrin's eyes and Matt's dagger. Neither would have happened if they had not left Emmons Field, and it was Moiraine who had taken them away. They would probably all be dead at Trolloc's hands and a good part of Emmons Field as well if she had not come to their village, but that did not make Perrin laugh the way he used to or take the dagger from Matt's belt. Matt was still looking at him quizzically, and Perrin had raised his head enough to stare from under his eyebrows. Loyal waited patiently. Rand could not tell them why he had to stay away from the Emerlin seat. They did not know what he was. Lan knew, and Warain, and Egwene and Nynev. He wished none of them knew, and most of all he wished Egwene did not. But at least Matt and Perrin and Loyal believed he was still the same. He thought he would rather die than let them know, than see the hesitation and worry he sometimes caught in Egwene's eyes, and Nynev's. Finally Rand said, I feel as if somebody is watching me, following me, only there's nobody there. And there was the wind, Rand added. He told them that while practicing the sword with Lan, that the wind held him stiffly. I just want to leave here, Rand finished. I want to go south, somewhere away. Matt asked, But if the gates are barred, how do we get out? Rand stared at him. We? He had to go alone. It would be dangerous for anyone near him eventually. He would be dangerous, and even Warren could not tell him how long he had. Matt, you know you have to go to Tarvalon with Moiraen. She said that's the only place you can be separated from that bloody dagger without dying, and you know what will happen if you keep it. Besides, maybe I don't want you two going with me, always hanging around, falling into trouble, and expecting me to pull you out. Burn me! Did it ever occur to you that I might be tired of always having you there whenever I turn around? The hurt on Perrin's face cut him like a knife, but he pushed on relentlessly. There are some here that think I'm a lord. Maybe I like that, but look at you, dicing with the stable hands. When I go, I go by myself. You two can go to Tarvalon or go hang yourselves, but I leave alone. Matt's face had gone stiff. However you want it, Althor. Rand watched them go with a stick caught in his throat. I must go alone, he thought. Light, help me, I have to. Rand made his voice harsh. What are you waiting for, Loyal? Go with them. As the augur caught up with Perrin and Matt, Rand slumped against some sacks. Light knows, he thought. I will be dangerous just to be around. Blood and ashes, I'm going mad. No, I won't use the power. And then I won't go mad, but I can't risk it. I just can't. He left the storeroom and came out into a torch-lit corridor. Egwene was creeping along it. What are you doing here? She smiled. Why, I come through here to the dungeon to see Padden Fane. Why do you visit the peddler? He's a dark friend. Burn me, Egwene. He brought the Trollocs to Emmons Field, the Dark One's hound, he called himself. It was her turn to hesitate, and she looked at him, almost pleading. Rand, he has brought his wagon into the two rivers every spring since before I was born. He knows all the people I know, all the places. It's strange, but the longer he has been locked up, the easier in himself he has become. It's almost as if he's breaking free of the Dark One. He laughs again and tells funny stories. I just like to talk to somebody about home. Egwene, Padden Fane is a Dark Friend, and as bad as ever a Dark Friend was. Oh, nonsense, Rand. Come along, I will show you. They stopped in a passageway deep beneath the keep before a tall door with a small iron grill set in it. Through the grill, Rand could see two top-knotted soldiers sitting bareheaded at a table with a lamp on it. Egwene rapped the clapper on the door, a sharp clang of iron on iron. One man rose and came over. "'What do you want?' "'Oh, it's you again, girl. Come to see a dark friend who's at.' He's a friend of mine. He wants to see Master Fane, too. The man studied Ran and said finally, Tall, aren't you? And fancy dress for your kind. Well, come in if you're coming. Ran followed Egwene in. 
The room was bare except for the table and benches and shelves, and another iron-bound door leading deeper in. The soldier thrust a lamp at Egwene. Fane was sitting on his cot. He was a bony, sharp-eyed man, with long arms and a big nose, and even more gaunt than Ran remembered. The sight of him brought back memories Ran would just as soon have done without. Fane on the seat of his big peddler's wagon, arriving in Emmons Field the day of winter night, and on winter night the Trollocs came, killing and burning, hunting. Hunting three young men, Moraine had said. Hunting me, Ran thought, and using Fane for their trailhound. Fane stood at Egwene's approach. He smiled at her, then raised his eyes above her head. Looking straight at Rand, he pointed a long finger at him. I feel you there hiding, Rand Althor. You can't hide, not from me and not from them. You thought it was over, did you not? But the battle's never done, Althor. They're coming for me, and they're coming for you, and the war goes on. Whether you live or die, it's never over for you. Never. Egwene backed away from the cell until she reached Rand. Darkness hid the peddler, but they could still hear his laughter. With a shiver, Rand pried his fingers off his sword hilt. This is what you call being like he used to be? Egwene's voice was unsteady. Sometimes he's better and sometimes worse. This is much worse than usual. Fane's laughing whisper came through the black shadows. Moiraine stood before the Emerlin seat. The Emerlin had been born in Tyr, and her name was Simon Sange, though very few had used that name in the ten years since she'd been raised from the Hall of the Tower. She was the Emerlin seat. That was the whole of it. The broad stole on her shoulders was striped in the colors of the seven Ajas. The Emerlin was of all Ajas and of none. She was of medium height, and handsome rather than beautiful, but her face held strength, and her clear blue gaze had made kings and queens and even the captain commander of the Children of Light drop their eyes. Her own eyes were strained now, and there was a new tightness to her mouth. We called the winds to speed our vessels up the Erinin River, daughter, and even turned the currents to our aid. The Emberlin's voice was deep and sad. I have seen the flooding we caused in villages along the river, and the light only knows what we have done to the weather. We will not have endeared ourselves by the damage we have done and the crops we may have ruined, all to reach here as quickly as possible. Her eyes strayed momentarily. When she spoke, it was to say, Elida Sedai is in Tarvalan daughter. She came with Elaine and go in. Moiraine was conscious of Leanne standing to one side, quiet as always in the presence of the Amrillin, but watching, listening. "'I'm surprised, mother,' Moiraine said carefully. "'This is no time for Queen Morgas to be without Eleda, without Aes Sedai Council. Morgas was one of the few rulers to openly admit to an Aes Sedai Counselor. Almost all had one, but few admitted it. "'I Doubt Morgas is a match for Eleda in a contest of wills, daughter. In any case, perhaps this time she did not wish to be. Elaine has potential, more than I have ever seen before. Already she shows progress. The Red Sisters are swollen up like puff fish with it. I don't think the girl leans to their way of thinking, but she is young and there is no telling. Even if they don't manage to bend her, it will make little difference. Elaine could well be the most powerful Aes Sedai in a thousand years, and it is the Red Aja who found her. They have gained much status in the hall from the girl. I have two young women with me in Faldara, mother, Moiraine said, both from the two rivers where the blood of Mantheran still runs strong, though they do not even remember there was once a land called Mantheran. The old blood sings, mother, and it sings loudly in the two rivers. Egwene, a village girl, is at least as strong as Elaine. I have seen the daughter heir, and I know. As for the other, Nynev was the wisdom in their village. Yet she is little more than a girl herself. 
It says something of her that the women of her village chose her wisdom at her age. Once she gains conscious control of what she now does without knowing, she will be as strong as any in Tarvalon, and there's no chance that these two will choose the red. They're amused by men, exasperated by them, but they do like them. They will easily counter whatever influence the red Aja gains in the White Tower from finding Elaine. The Amrilla nodded as if it were all of no consequence. Those were the two main concerns in the Hall of the Tower, that fewer girls who could be trained to channel the One Power were found every year, and that fewer of real power were found. Eleda had another reason for coming to Tarvalon, daughter. She sent the same message by six different pigeons to make sure I received it, then came herself. She told the Hall of the Tower that you are meddling with a young man who is Taveran and dangerous. He was in Camelin, she said, but she discovered you had spirited him away. End of Side One The people at that inn served us well and faithfully, Mother. If she harmed any of them, Moiraine could not keep the sharpness out of her voice, and she heard Leanne shift. You should know, daughter, the Amarillan said dryly, that Elada harms no one except those she considers dangerous. Dark friends are those poor fool men who tried to channel the One Power. He later spoke more of the young man you took away with you. More dangerous than any man since Artur Hawkwing, she said. She has the foretelling sometimes, you know, and her words carried weight with the hall. For Leanne's sake, Moiraine made her voice as meek as she could. I have three young men with me, mother, but none of them is a king, and I doubt very much if any of them even dreams of uniting the world under one ruler. No one has dreamed Arthur Hawkwing's dream since the War of the Hundred Years. Yes, daughter, village youths, so Lord Agomar tells me, but one of them is Taveran. It was put forward in the hall that you should be sent into retreat for contemplation. This was proposed by one of the sisters for the Green Aja. Leanne made a sound of disgust, or perhaps frustration. She always kept in the background when the Amarillan seat spoke, but Moiraine could understand the small interruption this time. The green Aja had been allied with the blue for a thousand years. Since Arthur Hawkwing's time, they had all but spoken with one voice. I have no desire to hoe vegetables in some remote village, mother. Nor will I, whatever the hall of the tower says. There was another proposal, one that still smells like weak old fish on the jetty. Since Leanne is of the Blue Aja, and I came from the Blue, it was put forward that sending two sisters of the Blue with me on this journey would give the Blue four representatives, proposed in the hall to my face, as if they were discussing repairing the drains. Two of the White Sisters stood against me, and two Green. The Yellow muttered amongst themselves, then would not speak for or against. There was even some open talk that I should not leave the White Tower at all. Moiraine was shocked. Whatever Aja she came from, the keeper of the Chronicles, Leanne, spoke only for the Amrillan. And the Amrillan spoke for all Aesodai and all Ajas. That was the way it had always been. And no one had ever suggested otherwise. Not in the darkest days of the Trolloc Wars. Not when Arthur Hawkwing's armies had penned every surviving Aesodai inside Tarvalon. Above all, the Amrillan seat was the Amrillan seat. Every Ace Sedai was pledged to obey her. No one could question what she did or where she chose to go. This proposal went against three thousand years of custom and law. Who would dare, mother? The Amrillan seat's laugh was bitter. Almost any one, daughter. Riots in Camelin, the great hunt for the Horn of Valir called without any of us having a hint of it until the proclamation. False dragons popping up everywhere, nations fading, and more nobles playing at the game of houses than at any time since Arthur Hawkwing cut all their plotting short. And worst of all, every one of us knows the Dark One is stirring again. Most sisters think the White Tower is losing its grip on events. Time may be growing short for all of us, daughter. As you say, mother, but there are still worse perils outside the shining walls than within. For a long moment the Amrillan met Moiraine's gaze, then nodded slowly. Leave us, Leanne. I would talk to my daughter Moiraine alone. 
There was only a moment's hesitation before Leanne said, "'As you wish, mother.' Maureen could feel her surprise. The Amrillan gave few audiences without the keeper of the chronicles present, especially not to his sister she had reason to chastise. The door opened and closed behind Leanne. She would not say a word in the anteroom of what had occurred inside, but the news that Moraine was alone with the Amrillan would spread through the Aes Sedai and Faldara like wildfire, and the speculation would begin. As soon as the door closed, the Amrillan stood, and Moraine felt a momentary tingle in her skin as the other woman channeled the one power. For an instant, the Amrillan seat seemed to be surrounded by a nimbus of bright light. Suddenly, she threw her arms around Moiraine, a warm hug between old friends. Moiraine hugged back as warmly. You are the only one, Moiraine, with whom I can remember who I was. Even Leanne always acts as if I had become the stole and the staff, as if we'd never giggled together as novices. Sometimes I wish we were still novices, you and I. Still innocent enough to see as a gleeman's tale come true. Still innocent enough to think we would find men. They would be princes, remember, handsome and strong and gentle. Men who could bear to live with women of an ace of die power. Still innocent enough to dream of living our lives as other women do. We are Aes Sedai, Siwan. We have our duty. Even if you and I had not been born to channel, would you give it up for a home and a husband, even a prince? <laughs> I do not believe it. The Amrillan stepped back. No, I would not give it up. Most of the time. Moiraine, if anyone, even Leanne, discovers what we plan, we will both be stilled, and I can't say they would be wrong to do it. Stilled. The word seemed to quiver in the air, almost visible. When it was done to a man who could channel the power, who must be stopped before madness drove him to the destruction of all around him, it was called gentling. But for Ace Sedai, it was stilling. Stilled. No longer able to channel the flow of the one power, able to sense Sidar, the female half of the true source, but no longer having the ability to touch it. Remembering what was gone forever. So seldom had it been done that every novice was required to learn the name of each Aes die since the breaking of the world who had been stilled, and her crime. But none could think of it without a shudder. Women bore being stilled no better than men did being gentled. Moiraine said, What we do, Siwan, is what must be done. We have both known it for nearly twenty years. The wheel weaves as the wheel wills, and you and I were chosen for this by the pattern. We are a part of the prophecies, and the prophecies must be fulfilled. Abruptly, Siwan slapped the table with a loud crack. I am not suggesting giving up, but most of my troubles with the hall stem from you. We had a plan, a plan, Moiraine. Locate the boy and bring him to Tarvalin, where we could hide him, keep him safe, and guide him. Since you left the tower, I have had only two messages from you. One message to say you were entering the two rivers, going to this village, this Emmons field. Then word from Camelin to say you were coming to Shinar, to Faldara, not Tarvalin. Faldara, with the blight almost close enough to touch. Faldara, where Trollocs raid and Mirdral ride as near every day, makes no difference. Nearly twenty years of planning and searching, and you toss all of our plans practically into the Dark One's face. Are you mad? Now that she had stirred life in the other woman, Moiraine returned to outward calm, calm but firm insistence, too. The pattern pays no heed to human plans, Siwan. With all our scheming, we forgot what we were dealing with. Taviran. The wheel will weave the pattern around this young man as it wills, whatever our plans. The Emerlin's face expressed shock. Are you saying we might as well give up? No, Siwan. We must now realize that our plans are precarious things. We have even less control than we thought. The Amrillan went to the ornate chest on a table, lifted the top to reveal a golden horn nestled there. The Horn of Valir, made to call dead heroes back from the grave, and prophecy said it would only be found just in time for the last battle. Abruptly she closed the lid. Lord Agomar pushed it into my hands as soon as we arrived. He said he was afraid to go into his strong room any longer with it there. The temptation was too great, he said. 
to sound the horn itself and lead the host that answered north through the blight to level Shao Gul itself and put an end to the Dark One. He burned with the ecstasy of glory, and it was that, he said, that told him it was not to be him, must not be him. Moiraine nodded, saying, The prophecies of the dragon. But, daughter, there was never more than one false dragon in a generation since the breaking, and now three are loose in the world at one time, and three more in the past two years. The pattern demands a dragon because the pattern weaves toward Taramon Gaidon. What if Loghain was the one, Moiraine? He could channel before the Reds took him to the White Tower, and we gentled him. So can Mazram Tem, the man in Saldea. What if it is him? There are sisters in Saldea already. He may be taken by now. Neither one of them is the one, Siwan. The pattern does not demand a dragon, but the one true dragon. Until he proclaims himself, the pattern will continue to throw up false dragons, but after that there will be no others. If Loghain or the other were the one, there would be no others. You could never hide what you were thinking from me as you do from everyone else, Moiraine. You have more to tell me, and nothing good. For an answer, Moiraine took the leather pouch from her belt and upended it, spilling the contents onto the table. It appeared to be only a heap of fragmented pottery, shiny black and white. The Amrillan seat touched one bit curiously, and her breath caught. Quindelar. Heartstone, Moiraine agreed. The making of Quindelar had been lost at the breaking of the world. No known force could break Quindelar once it was complete. Even the one power directed against Heartstone only made it stronger. Except that some power had broken this. The Amrillan hastily assembled the pieces. What they formed was a disc the size of a man's hand, half blacker than pitch and half whiter than snow. The colors met along a sinuous line unfaded by age. The ancient symbol of Ace Sedai before the world was broken, when men and women wielded the power together. Half of it was now called the Flame of Tarvalon. The other half was scrawled on doors, the dragon's fang, to accuse those within of evil. Only seven like it had been made. Everything ever made of Hearthstone was recorded in the White Tower, and those seven were remembered above all. Siwan Sunch stared at it, as she would have a viper on her pillow. One of the seals in the Dark One's prison, she said finally. It was those seven seals over which the Amrillan seat was supposed to be a watcher. The secret hidden from the world was that no Amrillan seat had known where any of the seals were since the Trolloc Wars. We know the Dark One is stirring, Siwan. We know his prison cannot stay sealed forever. Dark friends multiply, and what we called evil but ten years ago seems almost caprice compared with what now is done every day. If the seals are already breaking, we may have no time at all. Little enough, Moiraine, but that will have to do. The Amrillin touched the fractured seal, and her voice grew tight. I saw the boy Rand in the courtyard. Moiraine, he blazed like the sun. I've seldom been afraid in my life, but the sight of him made me afraid right down to my toes. I could barely speak. Agalmar thought I was angry with him. I said so little. That young man, he's the one we have sought these twenty years. Moiraine answered, he is. Are you certain? Can he channel the one power? He can. A man wielding the one power. That was a thing no Ace or die could contemplate without fear. Rand Althor will stand before the world as the dragon reborn. If he is the one, then we truly may have time enough. But is he safe here? I have two red sisters with me. I can no longer answer for green or yellow either. Light consume me. I can't answer for any of them. Not with this. Even Varen would leap on him the way she would a scarlet adder in a nursery. 
he is safe for the moment. The Amarillin said, You say our old plan is useless. What do you suggest now? I have purposely let him think I no longer have any interest in him, that he may go where he pleases for all of me. It was necessary, Siwan. Randall Thor is stubborn. He has to be handled gently, or he will bolt in any direction but the one we want. Then we'll handle him like a newborn babe, but to what immediate purpose? His two friends, Matrim Cawtham and Perrin Ibarra, are ripe to see the world before they sink back into the obscurity of the two rivers. If they can sink back, for they are Taviran too, if lesser than he, I will induce them to carry the Horn of Villiers to Ilion. She hesitated, frowning. There is a problem with Matt. He carries a dagger from Shadow Logoth. Shadow Logoth, Light, why did you ever let them get near that place? Every stone of it is tainted. If more death touched the boy, the world would be doomed. But it did not, see one. I have done enough so that Matt will not infect others, but he had the dagger too long before I knew. The link is still there. I had thought I must take him to Darvalon to cure it, but with so many sisters present, it might be done here. You and I and two others will suffice using my angrial. Sion Sanz said, Leanne will do for one, and I can find another. Suddenly the Amrillin seat gave a wry grin. The hall wants that Angriel back, Moraine. There are not very many of them left, and you are now considered unreliable. Moraine smiled, but it did not touch her eyes. They will think worse of me before I am done. Matt will leap at the chance to be so big a part of the legend of the Horn, and parents should not be hard to convince. Ran knows what he is, and he is afraid of it naturally. He wants to go off somewhere alone, where he cannot hurt anyone. He says he will never wield the power again, but he fears not being able to stop it. As well he might. Easier to give up drinking water, daughter. Exactly, and he wants to be free from Aes Sedai. Once Ran is offered the chance to leave Aes Sedai behind and still stay with his friends a while longer, he should be as eager as Matt. But how is he leaving Aes Sedai behind? Surely you must travel with him. We can't lose him now, Moiraine. They will travel on a long leash, Siwan, and when Ran needs me in Ilion, I will be there, and I will see that it is he who presents the horn to the Council of Nine and the Assemblage. Siwan, the Ilioners would follow the dragon or Balsamon himself if he came bearing the horn of Valer. The dragon reborn will begin with a nation around him and an army at his back. We have been closeted alone too long already. We can contrive another meeting tomorrow. I suppose you are right, but first thing in the morning there's so much I have to know. The Amrillin rose and they hugged again. Leanne gave Moiraine a sharp look when she came out into the ante-room. Moiraine tried to put on a chastened face, as if she had endured one of the Amrillin's infamous upbraidings. The column would have made an impressive sight moving through the Tarabon night had there been anyone to see it. A full two thousand children of the light, well mounted in white cloaks, armor burnished, with their train of supply wagons. They were to meet someone at a village near the northern border of Tarabon, at the edge of Almuth Plain. Geofram Bornhald, riding at the head of his men, wondered what it was all about. He remembered too well his interview with Pedron Dial. Lord Captain Commander of the Children of the Light in Amador, but he had learned little there. My Lord Captain Commander, may I ask why I was called back from Camelin? A push, and Queen Morgas could be toppled. There are houses in Andor that see dealing with Tarvalin as we do, and they were ready to lay claim to Morgas's throne. I left Aemon Valda in charge, but he seemed intent on going to Tarvalon, following the Lady Elaine, Morgas's daughter heir. I would not be surprised to learn the man has kidnapped the girl, or even attacked Tarvalon. But the captain commander had responded, Geofram, you are the best battle commander among the children. You assemble a full legion, and the best men you can find, and take them into Tarabon. 
Is it war, my lord captain commander? There is talk in the streets, wild rumors, mainly about Arthur Hawkwing's armies come back. The lord captain commander had said, You will be met at a village called Alcruna, and there you will receive your final orders. I expect your legion to ride in three days. Now, the scouts Gia from Bordhold had set out came riding back, and behind them came more men in white cloaks. Their cloaks bore the same golden sunburst on the breast as his, the same as every child of the light, and their leader's rank was equivalent to Bornhold's. But behind their sunburst were red shepherd's crooks. Questioners. With hot irons and pinchers and dripping water, the questioners pulled confession and repentance from dark friends, but there were those who said they decided guilt before they ever began. Geoffrey Bornhold was one who said it. I have been sent here to meet questioners? The leader said, We have been waiting for you, Lord Captain Bornhold. I am Einor Saren. There is a bridge at the village. Have your men move across. We will talk in the inn. It is surprisingly comfortable. But I was told to avoid all eyes. The village has been pacified. Now move your men. I command now. I have orders with the Lord Captain Commander's seal, if you doubt. Bornhold suppressed the growl that rose in his throat pacified? He wondered if the bodies had been piled outside the village or if they had been thrown into a river. It would be like the questioners, cold enough to kill an entire village for secrecy and stupid enough to throw their bodies into the river to float downstream and trumpet their deed. What I doubt is why I am in Tarabon with two thousand men, questioner. If battle is what you seek, you may have your chance. The strangers have a great force on Toman Head. More than Tarabon and Arad Doman together may be able to hold back, even if they can stop their own bickering long enough to work together. If the strangers break through, you will have all the fighting you can handle. The Tarabonas claim the strangers are creatures of the Dark One. Some say they have Aes Sedai to fight for them. If they are Dark friends, they will have to be dealt with too. For a moment Bornhold stopped breathing. Then the rumors are true. Otto Hawkwing's armies have returned. Saren said, Strangers, and probably dark friends, that is all we know, and all you need to know. He whirled his horse and galloped back the way he had come. Bornhold called to his aid. Bayar, there is a bridge ahead. Move the legion across the river and make camp. I will join you as soon as I can. The farmhouse door shook under furious blows from outside. The heavy bar across the door jumped in its brackets. Beyond the window next to the door moved the heavy muzzled silhouette of a trollock. There were windows everywhere and more shadowy shapes outside. Rand backed away from the door, clutching his sword before him in both hands. Even if the door holds, they can break in the windows. Why aren't they trying the windows? With a deafening metallic screech, one of the brackets pulled away. Rand shouted, "'We have to stop them!' He looked around for a way to run, but there was only one door. The room was a box. Matt said, "'It's too late, don't you understand?' His grin looked odd on a bloodless pale face, and the hilt of a dagger stood out from his chest, the ruby that capped it, blazing as if it held fire. "'It's too late for us to change anything!' "'I've finally gotten rid of them,' Perrin said, laughing." Blood streamed down his face like a flood of tears from his empty sockets. He held out red hands, trying to make Rand look at what he held. I'm free now. It's over. It's never over, Althor, Pedan Fane cried, capering in the middle of the floor. The battle's never done. The door exploded in splinters and ran ducked away from the flying shards of wood. Two red-clad Aes Sedai stepped through, bowing their master in. A mask the color of dried blood covered Balzamon's face. But Ran could see the flames of his eyes through the eye slits. He could hear the roaring fires of Balzamon's mouth. "'It is not yet done between us, Althor.' Balzamon said, and he and Fane spoke together as one. For you, the battle is never done. 
With a strangled gasp, Rand sat up on the floor, clawing his way awake. Bleary-eyed, he looked around to convince himself that he was still hidden away. Egwene had left him, bedded down on a pallet in a corner of her room. The dim light of a single lamp suffused the room, and he was surprised to see Nynaeve knitting in a rocking chair on the other side of the lone bed. Without looking up, Nynaeve said, "'If you sleep in the afternoon, you can't expect to sleep at night.' He frowned, though she could not see it. She was only a few years older than he, but being a wisdom added fifty years of authority. He said, "'I needed a place to hide from the Aes Sedai, and I was tired.' "'Don't worry. We'll keep you hidden from the Amrillin or any other Aes Sedai, if that's what you want.' She met his eyes and jerked hers away. "'That's right,' Rand thought. "'I can channel the One Power. You ought to be helping the Aes Sedai hunt me down and gentle me.' "'They can't keep the gates barred forever, Nynaeve. Once they are opened, I will be gone, and the Aes Sedai will never find me.' But Rand, Moiraine insists you are Taviran, and I don't think she believes the wheel is finished with you. Shaitan is dead, he said harshly, and abruptly the room seemed to lurch. He grabbed his head as waves of dizziness sloshed through him. You're a fool, Rand, to name the dark when bringing his attention down on you. Don't you have enough trouble? She shook a fist at him. I would box your ears for you if I thought it would knock any sense into you. Suddenly, bells crashed out, ringing all over the keep. He bounded to his feet. "'That's an alarm! Egwene!' He crossed the room in quick strides and snatched up his sword and scabbard. He thought, "'Light! It's supposed to hurt me, not her!' Ran said, "'She's in the dungeon with Fane. What if he's come loose somehow?' There was turmoil around him out in the keep, men running for the courtyards with swords in hand, never looking at him. Over the clamor of alarm bells he could make out other noises now, shouts, screams, metal ringing on metal. He had just time to realize that it was sounds of battle. Fighting? Inside Faldara? Just then three Trollocs came dashing around a corner in front of him. Hairy snouts distorted otherwise human faces, and one of them had ram's horns. They bared teeth, raising scythe-like swords as they sped toward him. Caught by surprise, he unsheathed his sword awkwardly. A bare-snouted Trolloc easily evaded it, bumping the other two off stride for just an instant. Suddenly there were a dozen Shinarans rushing past him at the Trolloc, swords at the ready. The bare-snouted Trolloc snarled as it died, and its companions ran, pursued by shouting men waving steel. Shouts and screams filled the air from everywhere. Ran turned deeper into the keep. At a crossing of corridors was the tail end of a fight. Six top-knotted men lay bleeding and still, and a seventh man was dying. The mere draw gave its sword an extra twist as it pulled the blade free of the man's belly, and the soldier screamed as he dropped his sword and fell. The fade moved with viperous grace. It turned, and that pale, eyeless face studied Rand. It started toward him, smiling a bloodless smile, not hurrying. Rand felt rooted where he stood, his tongue stuck to the roof of his mouth. Abruptly the Myrdral stopped, its smile gone. This one is mine, Rand. Intgar's dark eyes never left the Fade's face. If the Shinaran felt the fear of that gaze, he gave no sign. Try yourself on a trolloc or two, he said softly before you face one of these. I was coming down to see if Egwene is safe. She was going to the dungeon to visit Fane. Then go see her, go. You want Trollocs to find her unprotected? The corridors beneath the keep were silent and feebly lit. The door to the dungeon stood cracked open. If Egwene was in there and in trouble, shouting would only warn whoever was endangering her. Taking a deep breath, he set himself. In one motion he pushed the door wide open with the scabbard in his left hand and threw himself into the dungeon. Rand tucked his shoulder under to roll through the straw covering the floor and come to his feet, spinning this way and that, looking for Egwene. His eyes fell on the table and he stopped dead. For there, as if to make a centerpiece, sat the heads of the guards in two pools of blood. Rand scrubbed his mouth with his sleeve 
Egwene, where are you? He started toward the inner door and stopped, for on it were the words, We will meet again at Toman Head. It's never over, Althor. As Rand searched further, he could hear behind him the voice of Moiraine speaking hurriedly to Leandrin. The door to Fane's cell stood open, and the cell was empty, but there inside were two shapes. Egwene and Matt laid sprawled unconscious. Moiraine! Egwene's hurt, and Matt! The Aes Sedai laid a hand on Egwene. Then she said, She's not badly hurt. She was struck, but that is the only injury she has taken. She will be all right. Moiraine called for litters. The girl is to be taken to her room, but the boy? Take him to the Emerlin Seat's chambers. The Emerlin will heal the boy. Lan strode into Rand's chambers. The Amrillin wants to see you, Shepherder. With a cold knot in the pit of his belly, Rand followed the warder. When they reached the Amrillin's chambers, Lian Sedai ushered only Rand inside. Moiraine sat to one side of the room, and one of the brown Aes Sedai on the other. Quickly Rand dropped to one knee, left hand on sword hilt, right fist pressed to the pattern rug. As you have summoned me, mother, so I have come. I stand ready. Stand up, boy, and let me have a look at you. She then gestured him to a ladder back chair. I know you can channel, boy. Some can be taught to channel, most cannot. You will continue to channel, boy. You can't help it. And you had better learn to channel, learn to control it, or you will not live long enough to go mad. I don't want to. I... Want to stop? Rand's confusion was evident. Why are you talking to me like this, mother? You should be gentling me. The Amrillin seat looked him straight in the eye and said, Because you are the dragon reborn. The void rocked. The world rocked. Everything seemed to spin around him. He concentrated on nothing, and the world steadied. I can channel... The light help me, but I am not Darksbane or Stonebow. You can gentle me or kill me, but I will not be a tame false dragon on a Tarvalon leash. The Amrillin demanded. Where did you hear those names? A gleeman, mother. His name was Tom Marilyn. He's dead now. Moiraine made a sound, and he glanced at her. She claimed Tom was not dead but she had never offered any proof, and Rand could not see how any man could survive grappling hand to hand with a fade. You are not a false dragon, the Emberlin said firmly. You are the true dragon reborn. I am a shepherd from the two rivers, mother. Daughter, tell him the story. A true story, boy. Listen well. Moiraine began speaking. Nearly twenty years ago, the Aegil crossed the spine of the world, burned the city of Kairain, and fought all the way to Tarvalon. After the Aegil retreated, the sisters went out to heal the wounded. My name is Rand Althor, I am a shepherd. My father is Tam Althor, my mother was Kari... Moiraine cut him off. The Karaithan Cycle the prophecies of the dragon says the dragon will be reborn on the slopes of Dragon Mount where he died during the breaking of the world. A Sedai, gifted in foretelling, spoke it to me. He is born again. I feel him. The dragon makes his first breath on the slope of Dragon Mount. He is coming. Light help the world. He lies in the snow and cries like the thunder. He burns like the sun. And then she fell forward into my arms. Dead. Rand's mind raced, recalling the ranting, fever-driven words his father Tam had uttered in illness. Slope of the mountain heard a baby cry, gave birth there alone before she died, child blue with cold. Rand tried to force Tam's voice away. I couldn't leave a child, always knew you wanted children, Curry. Rand pulled his eyes away from the Amarillan's gaze, he tried to force the void to hold. 
He knew that was not the way, but it was collapsing in him. Yes, lass, Rand's a good name. I am Rand Althor. His legs trembled. And so we knew the dragon was reborn, Warren went on. We found the story, that one man had found an infant on the mountain, and so we searched on. Then in the two rivers in Emmons Field I found three boys whose name days were within weeks of the battle at Dragon Mount, and one of them can channel. Did you think Trollocs came after you just because you are Taviran? You are the dragon reborn. Rand's knees gave way. He dropped to a squat, hands slapping the rug to catch himself from falling on his face. The void was gone. The stillness shattered. He raised his head, and they were looking at him. The three Aes die. I will not be used by you, the Amrillan said. An anchor is not demeaned by being used to hold a boat. You were made for a purpose, Randall Thor. The prophecies must be fulfilled, or the Dark One will break free and remake the world in its image. The last battle is coming, and you were born to unite mankind and lead them against the Dark One. Bowsamon is dead! Rand said hoarsely, and the Amarillan snorted like a stable hand. If you believe that, you are a fool. The Dark One lives, and he is breaking free. And you will face the Dark One. It is your destiny. When Fane was freed from the dungeon by Dark Friends, along with him went the chest, within which was the Horn of Alir and the Ruby Top Dagger. Now the Amarillan was taking her leave, and all from the castle were in the courtyard. Lord Inkar and the other men shifted in their saddles. The Amarillan looked at them and then spoke. Peace favor your sword, Lord Inktar. Glory to the builders, loyal Kisaran. All honor to Tarvalin, Loyal said, bowing. Only Rand and his two friends stayed upright. The Amarillan said, you ride to find the Horn of Valir, and the hope of the world rides with you. I charge you, Lord Ingtar, I charge all of you, find the Horn of Valir, and let nothing bar your way. As she went on, Rand had a feeling he was being watched. He peered up to the packed archers' balconies overlooking the courtyard. Somewhere among the rows of people was the set of eyes that followed him unseen. Suddenly something flashed across in front of Rand's face. A man passing behind the Amrillan cried out and fell, a black-fletched arrow jutting from his side. The Amrillan stood calmly looking at the rent in her sleeve. Blood slowly stained the gray silk. Agomar shook his blade at the sky. Find him! The Amrillan shook her sleeve. A poor shot for a white cloak bowman or a dark friend? Her eyes flickered up to touch Rand's. If it was at me, he aimed. Ingtar set a fast pace to the south for the beginning of the journey, aided in tracking by Hurin the sniffer. Matt and Perrin rode behind the column of soldiers with Rand. When Rand confessed to Matt and Perrin his ability to channel, Matt said, bloody ashes. If Ingtar and the others find out, they'll cut our bloody throats as dark friends. Light, they'll probably think we were part of the stealing of the horn. Shut up, Matt, Perrin said. Rand went on. The Amrillan seat told me I'm the dragon reborn, and then they said I should go wherever I wanted. Don't you see, Matt? They're trying to use me. The next morning when Rand awoke, he wondered if he were dreaming. Everything had changed. Almost everything. Loyal and Hurin still lay on either side of him, and their horses stood hobbled a pace away. But everyone else was gone. Soldiers, horses, his friends, everyone and everything gone. Hurin and the Augur were awake now, just as startled as Rand. Loyal asked, "'Where is everyone? What does all this mean, Lord Rand?' 
I don't know. I was hoping it was a dream. Maybe it is a dream. The sniffer said, We could follow the trail of the dark friends, my lord. You can still smell them? I can, my lord. It's faint, but I can smell the trail. Rand pulled up to full height. Then we will go after the dark friends. The horn must be recovered. Which way, Hurin? The sniffer pointed south. That night Rand took the first watch, letting the others sleep. He did not know how late it was when he suddenly realized a fog had risen. Anything at all could come right up to them unseen. He touched his sword. Swords do no good against me, Luce Theron. You should know that. The fog swirled around Rand's feet as he spun, the heron-marked blade in his hands. The void leaped up inside him. He barely noticed the tainted light of Sidon. Bowsamon! This is a dream. It has to be. Bowsamon laughed like the roar of an open furnace. You always try to deny what is loose there, and if I stretch out my hand, I can always touch you, Kinslayer. Rand bellowed. I am not the dragon. My name is Rand Althor. I have a thousand strings tied to you, Kinslayer. Rand gripped his sword hilt till his knuckles hurt. I deny you, and I deny your power. I walk in the light. The light preserves us, and we shelter in the palm of the Creator's hands. Balsamon's eyes became fire, and from his mouth the flame grew until it seemed brighter than the summer sun, and suddenly Rand's sword glowed as if just drawn from the forge. He cried out as the hilt burned his hands, screamed, and dropped the sword. In pain, he reached for Sidon, tried to wrap it around him. Suddenly, Balsamon was gone. I imagined it all. He looked around. Hurin shifted in his sleep next to Loyal. I did imagine it. Before relief had a chance to grow, pain stabbed his right hand. There, across the palm, was branded a heron. The heron from the hilt of his sword, angry and red, as neatly done as though drawn with an artist's skill. Night, on the edge of Kinslayer's dagger, was cold as nights in the mountains are always cold. The little band had followed the trail of the dark friends for many days now. The wind whipped down from the high peaks carrying the iciness of the snow caps. Rand shifted on the hard ground, tugging at his blanket, only half asleep. Suddenly Hurin panted into the campsite. Lord Rand! Loyal sat up, his blanket falling away. Is it my turn to watch already? Hurin the sniffer spoke. Fire, my lord, two miles down the hill. Rand thought. It must be Fane. He ordered Hurin to stay in the camp as he and the augur rode out for a look. They tethered their horses when they were closer to the enemy camp. Dim mounds on the ground became men wrapped in blankets by the moon's illumination. Sleeping trollocs. They had doused their fire. The moonlight seemed to brighten. For an instant Rand caught a gleam. The chest, the horn, and something atop. A point of red flashing in the moonbeam. The dagger! Motioning for Loal to follow, Rand dropped to his belly and crawled toward the chest. Dark friends lay to left and right of him. Slowly, silently, he slithered to the chest. Rand directed the large augur to grasp the chest. He wrapped his arms around the golden chest, lifting it effortlessly. Ever so carefully, the two made their way out of the camp, hastening back to Hurin. Did any of them follow Lord Rand? the sniffer asked. Rand slid down from his saddle. I don't think they did. He studied the chest for a moment. I'm taking it to Lord Agomar. It should go to Tarvalon, he thought, but I'm done with Aes Sedai. Let Agomar or Ingtar take it to them. Ran kept them moving through the night, allowing only a brief stop at dawn to rest the horses. Sometime during the night they had crossed the border of Kyrine. 
Hurin knew several inns in the city, though his time in Kyrine had been spent mainly in the foregate. The sniffer led them to one called the Defender of the Dragon Wall, where the little party settled itself. Loyal wanted to do some reading, and agreed to take the first watch over the horn while Hurin accompanied Rand downstairs. As soon as they reached the common room, the innkeeper, Kual, handed Rand three folded and sealed parchments, saying, "'Invitations to my lord, from three of the noble houses.' As Kual bowed himself away, Rand said, "'Who would know I was here?' "'Everyone by now, Lord Rand,' Hurin said. He seemed to feel eyes watching. The guards at the gate would not keep their mouths closed about an outland lord coming to Kyrine. Those like the innkeeper would tell what they know where they think it would do most good. Rand hurled the invitations into the fireplace. I'm not playing the game of the houses. I'm just here to wait for some friends. The two walked through the busy, bustling city. Glancing through the door of one of the large, windowless buildings, Rand saw what appeared to be a huge hall lined with people who jammed balconies with a large dais at one end. They were watching performers on the dais, jugglers, musicians, tumblers, and even a gleeman declaiming a story from the great hunt of the horn. That made Rand think of Tom Marilyn, and he hurried on. Memories of Tom were always sad. Tom had been a friend, a friend who died for him. He was making his way through the throng when a deep voice accompanied by the plucking of a harp drew Rand like a rope. With a harp in one arm, the man was bowing to the crowd. Aloud, Rand whispered, Tom? Holding Rand's eye, Tom Merrill nodded toward a door. Rand made his way to the door and threw it. When the gleeman came through, Rand couldn't contain himself. When I left Whitebridge... I was sure you were dead, Light Tom. It's good to see you again. I should have gone back to help you. Fool if you had, boy. That fate had no interest in me. It left me a little present of a stiff leg and ran off after you and Matt. You look as if you're doing well, boy. Very well. Tom, I have so much to tell you. Later, boy, I've got to go out and tell another. You come to the bunch of grapes just behind Jungai Gate. I have a room there, and bring my harp and flute. You still got them. Rand nodded as the gleeman stepped out onto the dais. Upon Rand's return, the innkeeper handed him yet more sealed parchment invitations. One bore the seal of King Galdrain himself, and the other of Lord Barthanes, next to the king in power. Rand showed his exasperation, trying to think of a way out of accepting the invitations. Suddenly someone in the common room shouted, Fire! All eyes turned toward the stairway, a flame with fire licking up the stairs. Rand broke into a run with the augur right behind him. Rand dropped, yelling to Loal, Keep low under the smoke! The door to Hearn's room had not caught yet, and Rand kicked it in. Hearn was sprawled on the floor, a lump on the side of his head. The chest was gone. The augur hefted the limp body of Hurin as Rand led the way back down the fiery stairs and into the street. Rand, it is you! Rand stared. It was Matt leading his horse through the crowd. A Matt whose face was pale and drawn, but still Matt and grinning if weakly, and behind him came Perrin and Ingtar. Rand felt a shiver run through him. He told him, It's too late. You came too late. Rand did not know Varen was there until the Aes Sedai took his face in her hands. For a moment he could see worry in her face, and then suddenly he felt as if he'd been doused with cold water. He gave an abrupt shudder as she left him to crouch over Hurin. He thought, What is she doing here? Matt asked, Rand, have you found... them... Rand took a deep breath. Matt, I had the dagger and I lost it. The dark friends took it back, and the chest. Matt sagged. They can't have gone far, though. Turning to Hurin, Rand asked, The men who hit you and started the fire left a trail, didn't they? Nodding, he responded, There were no Trollocs, but there were dark friends. I can follow their trail, my lord. Lowell added, 
I don't think they can open the chest, Rand, or they would have just taken the horn. Rand nodded. Once they're beyond the foregate, they'll join the Trollocs again for sure. He turned to Hurin. You rest until you're fit. Suddenly Rand was aware that they were all looking at him. I'm sorry, Ingtar. I've become used to being in charge, I suppose. I'm not trying to take your place. Ingtar nodded slowly. Moiraine chose well when she made Lord Agomar name you my second. Perhaps it would be better if the Amaryllin Seed had given you the charge. At least you actually managed to touch the horn. After that, they rode in silence. When the group finally reined in their horses at the crest of a hill, Matt asked, Rand, where are we? Toman's head. Matt looked worried. How are we going to find Fane in the dagger? He could be anywhere by now. He's here, Rand assured him. He hoped he was right. Fane had had time to take a ship any place he wanted to go. Light, let me not be too late. In Tarvalon about this time, Egwene and Nynaeve, sensing that Rand was in jeopardy, feeling his pain, were compelled to leave the tower grounds. They did so without permission. They had vowed to use all of their strengths and talents to come to his aid. Now, with Tarvalon to their backs, they went west toward Toman's head. Abetted by the Aes Sedai Leandrin, with the novitiate's Min and Elaine in tow. Egwene dismounted. There were only a few trees close by, and a morning breeze ruffled foliage with a little more color than the leaves had had in Tarvalon. Watching Leandrin and her friends emerge through the morning fog, she became aware that the others were already there. They were as odd a group as she had ever seen, and she had heard too many rumors of the war on Tomon Head. Armored men, at least fifty of them, with overlapping steel plates down their chests and dull black helmets shaped like insects' heads, sat their saddles or stood beside their horses staring at the women. There were women with the soldiers, too. Two wore plain, dark, gray dresses with wide silver collars. They stood staring intently at those emerging from the fog, each with another woman close behind her as if ready to speak in her ear. Honest of all, was the last woman, reclining on a pallet borne by eight muscular men. The sides of her scalp were shaved so that only a wide crest of black hair remained to fall down her back. Leandrin Sedai, Egwene asked uneasily, do you know who these people are? The High Lady Suroth. The woman on the pallet nodded, saying, we must be done here quickly, Leandrin. I mean to be back in Falme before Turak knows I'm gone. Leandrin laid a hand on Nynaeve's shoulder and on one of Egwene's. These are the two of whom you were told, and there is one other. She nodded toward Elaine. She is the daughter heir of Andor, Queen Morgas's daughter. Egwene showed apprehension. Leandrin said I, who are these people? And are they here to help Brand and the others too? A hook-nosed man suddenly seized Min and Elaine, and in the next instant everything seemed to happen at once. Abruptly the breeze was a gale that whipped away Leandrin's angry shout in clouds of dirt and leaves and made the trees bend and groan. Horses reared and whinnied shrilly, and one of the women reached out and fastened something around Egwene's neck. Cloak flapping like a sail, Egwene braced against the wind and tugged at what felt like a collar of smooth metal. It would not budge. Under her frantic fingers, it felt all of one piece, though she knew it had to have some kind of clasp. The silvery coils the woman carried trailed over Egwene's shoulder, their other end joining a bright bracelet on the woman's left wrist. Balling her fist tightly, Egwene hit the woman as hard as she could, right in her eye, and staggered and fell to her knees herself, head ringing. It felt as if a large man had struck her in the face. When she could see straight once more, the wind had died. Some of the soldiers were cursing and picking themselves up off the ground. Leandrin was calmly brushing dust and leaves from her dress. Min knelt, supporting herself with her hands groggily trying to rise further. The hook-nosed man stood over her, his hand dripping blood. Min's knife lay just out of her reach, the blade stained red along one side. Nine of Inelaine were nowhere to be seen, 
and nine of his mare was gone too. Egwene could see now that the other women were linked by a silver cord just like the one that still joined her to the woman standing over her. That woman was rubbing her cheek as she squatted beside Egwene. There was a bruise already coming up around her left eye. With long dark hair and big brown eyes, she was pretty and perhaps as much as ten years older than nine of. That was your first lesson, she said emphatically. I will not punish you further this time, since I should have been on guard with the newly caught Damani. Know this. You are a Damani, a leashed one. And I am a Soldam, a holder of the leash. When Damani and Soldam are joined, whatever hurt the Soldam feels, the Damani feels twice over, even to death. So you must remember that you may never strike at a Soldam in any way, and you must protect your Soldam even more than yourself. I am Rena. Egwene had the sinking feeling that the Andrin Sedai had betrayed them. There would be a reckoning, some day, somehow. The bare-chested men knelt, lowering the pallet to the ground, and Suroth stepped down. You were to bring me two, Siroth said. Instead, I have only one, while two run loose, one of them more powerful by far than I had been led to believe, judging by the gale she caused. She will attract every patrol of ours within two leagues. I brought you three, Leandrid said calmly. If you cannot manage to hold them, perhaps our master should find another among you to serve him. You take fright at trifles. If patrols come, kill them. Lightning flashed in the near distance, and moments later something roared like thunder not far from where it struck. A cloud of dust rose into the air. Neither Leandrin nor Suroth took any notice. Suroth said, This grows tiresome. Recall the men. The hook-nosed man produced a horn no bigger than his fist. It made a hoarse, piercing cry. You must find the woman, Nynaeve, Neandred said sharply. Elaine is of no importance, but both women I brought and this girl, Min, must be taken with you. Nynaeve leaned out of her saddle to peer around the screen of shrubs. Sweat beaded on her forehead and was not all from exertion. Her contact with Sidar was gone, and she could not bring it back. In that first fury of knowing that Leandrin had betrayed them, Sidar had been there. Almost before Nynaeve knew it, the one power had flooded her. It had seemed she could do anything, and as long as they had chased her, rage at being hunted like an animal had fueled her. Now the chase vanished. The longer she had gone without seeing an enemy, the more she had begun to worry about what was happening to Egwene and Elaine and Min. Something stirred behind a tree. Her breath caught, and she fumbled for Sidara, but it did no good. She could feel it, sense the source, but she could not touch it. Elaine stepped from behind the tree in a wary crouch, and Nynaeve sagged with relief. The daughter heir's dress was dirty and torn. Her golden hair was a tangle of snarls, but she held a short-bladed dagger in a steady hand. Nynaeve picked up her reins and rode into the open. Elaine gave a convulsive jump, and then her hand went to her throat and she drew a deep breath. Nynaeve dismounted and the two women hugged, taking comfort in having found each other. Elaine said, There were two men following me. Another few minutes and they would have caught me, but a horn sounded and they turned their horses and galloped off. They could see me, Nynaeve, and they just left. I heard it too, and I haven't seen any of them since. Have you seen Egwene or Min? Elaine shook her head, slumping to sit on the ground. Not since that man hit Min, knocked her down. And one of those women was putting something around Egwene's neck. I saw that much before I ran. I don't think they got away, Nynaeve. Oh, Light, I should have done something. Min cut the hand that was holding me in Egwene. I just ran, Nynaeve. I realized I was free, and I ran. Egwene, if you had waited, you would be a prisoner, too. Thunder rumbled across the slate-dark afternoon sky. Ran pulled the hood of his cloak further up to keep the cold rain off. The column plodded along. Ingtar's grey owl banner hung heavily even when the wind gusted. Hurin sometimes pulled his cowl back to sniff the air, but so far the sniffer had found nothing. Behind him Ran heard the soldier Uno mutter a curse. 
Everyone was miserable except for Varen, who appeared too lost in thought even to notice that her hood had slid back, exposing her face to the rain. They had learned a little of the invaders in that village called Atuan's Mill, though most of what they had heard hatched more questions than it answered. The people had babbled one moment and clamped their mouths shut the next, trembling looking over their shoulders. They all shook with fear that the Sianshan invaders would return with their monsters and their demane, that women who should have been Aes die were instead leashed like animals frightened the villagers even more than the strange creatures the Sianshan commanded. And worst of all, the examples the Sianshan had made before leaving still chilled the people to their marrow. They had buried their dead, but they feared to clean away the large charred path in the village square. None of them would say what had happened there, but Hurin had vomited as soon as they entered the village, and he would not go near the blackened ground. Atuan's mill had been half deserted. Some had fled to Falme, thinking the Sianshan would not be so harsh in a town they had held fast, and others had gone east. More had said they were thinking of it. There was fighting on Almuth Plain, Tarabana's battling Domani, it was said. Even a war was easier to face than what the Sianshan had done, what they might do. Why did Fane bring the horn here? Perrin muttered. There's war, and the Sianshan and their monsters. Why here? The group found barn loft rooms in the next village, and now Rand was trying to sleep, but there were no blankets. Riley, he thought the only thing dry he had for a coverlet was the dragon's banner. He left it safely buckled in his saddlebags. The dragon's banner, the banner of Luce Theron Telemon, Luce Theron Kinslayer, the banner Moiraine had given to Ingtar as a bundle, in turn to be given to Rand once they were away from Faldara. He had stuffed it into his saddlebags, denying the link. Shivering, he rolled this way and that on the mattress, wondering if the banner would not do for a blanket after all, wondering if he should ride on to Falme. He rolled to his other side, and Balzamon was standing beside the chair with the pure white length of the dragon's banner in his hand. Rand looked at his pitch-dark eyes as they vanished for an instant, replaced by endless caverns of fire. Rand's saddlebags lay by his feet, buckles undone, flap thrown back where the banner had been hidden. The time comes closer, Luz Theron. A thousand threads draw tight, and soon you will be tied and trapped, set to a course you cannot change. Madness. Death. Before you die, will you once more kill everything you love? Rand glanced at the door, but he made no move except to sit up on the side of the bed. What good trying to run from the dark one? His throat felt like sand. I am not the dragon, father of lies. The darkness beyond Balsamon roiled, and furnaces roared, and Balsamon laughed. You honor me, and belittle yourself. I know you too well. I have faced you a thousand times, a thousand times a thousand. I know you to your miserable soul, Deuce Theron Kinslayer. He laughed again. Rand put a hand in front of his face against the heat of that fiery mouth. What do you want? I will not serve you. I will not do anything that you want. I will die first. You will die, worm. How many times have you died across the span of the ages, fool? How much has death availed you? This time there will be no rebirth for you. This time the wheel of time will be broken and the world remade in the image of the shadow. This time your death will be forever. Which will you choose? Death everlasting or life eternal and power? Rand hardly realized that he was on his feet. The void had surrounded him. Sidon was there, and the one power flowed into him. He hurled it at Balsamon, hurled the pure one power, the force that turned the wheel of time, a force that could make seas burn and eat mountains. Balsamon took half a step back, holding the banner clutched before him. 
Flames leaped into his wide eyes and mouth, and the darkness seemed to cloak him in shadow. Fool! Balsamon roared. You will destroy yourself! Matt! The thought floated somewhere beyond the consuming flood. The dagger! The horn, Fane, I can't die yet! He was not sure how he did it, but suddenly the power was gone, and Sidon, and the void. Shuddering uncontrollably, he fell to his knees beside the bed, arms wrapped around himself in a vain effort to stop their twitching. That is better, loose therein. Balsamon tossed the banner to the floor and put his hands on the chair back. Wisps of smoke rose from between his fingers. There is your banner, Kinslayer. Much good will it do you. A thousand strings laid over a thousand years have drawn you here. The wheel itself holds you prisoner to your fate, age after age, but I can set you free. You cowering cur. I alone in the entire world can teach you how to wield the power. I alone can stop it killing you before you have a chance to go mad. I alone can stop the madness. You have served me before. Serve me again, loose therein, or be destroyed forever. My name is Randall Thor. His shivering forced him to squeeze his eyes shut, and when he opened them again, he was alone. Balsamon was gone. The shadow was gone. His saddlebag stood against the chair with the buckles done up and one side bulging with the bulk of the dragon's banner just as he had left it, but on the chair back tendrils of smoke still rose from the charred impressions of fingers. The rising sun pushed its crimson edge above the horizon and sent long shadows down the cobblestone streets of Falme toward the harbor. Nynaeve warmed her hands under her arms and surveyed her army. Min sat on a doorstep across the way, eating a wrinkled plum, and Elaine huddled at the edge of an alley just down the street from her. My army, Nynaeve thought grimly, but there isn't anybody else. She caught sight of a soldam and a damani climbing the street, a yellow-haired woman wearing the bracelet, and a dark woman the collar, both yawning sleepily. The few foulmen sharing the streets with them averted their eyes and gave them a wide berth. As far as she could see down toward the harbor, there was not another Sianchon. Nine of us all too aware that she had no real notion of whether what she planned would work or not. It could easily be her own failure that would give them away. Once again, she resolved that if anything went wrong, she would somehow pull attention to herself while Min and Elaine escaped. She had told them to run if anything went wrong, and let them think she would run too. What she would do then, she did not know. Except that I won't let them take me alive. Please, Light, not that. Soldam and Damani came up the street until they were bracketed by three waiting women. A dozen farmen walked wide of the linked pair— Nine have gathered all of her anger. Leashed ones and leash holders. They had put their filthy collar on Egwene's neck, and they would put it on hers and Elaine's if they could. In an instant, a white blossom had opened to light to Sidar, and the one power filled Nineiv. She knew there was a glow around her for those who could see it. The pale-skinned Sildam gave a start, and the dark Damani's mouth fell open, but Nineiv gave them no chance. It was only a trickle of the power that she channeled, but she cracked it, a whip snapping a dust moat out of the air. The silver collar sprang open and clattered to the cobblestones. Nynaeve heaved a sigh of relief even as she leaped to her feet. The Soldam stared at the fallen collar as if at a poisonous snake. The Damani put a shaking hand to her throat and then turned and punched the Soldam in the face. The Damani took one startled look around, then ran as hard as she could. Nynaeve produced a handful of rags from her pocket and ruthlessly stuffed them into the gaping mouth of the still staggering Soldam. Min hastily shook out a sack and plunged it over the Soldam's head, shrouding the woman to the waist. 
Nine of the men wrestled her toward a nearby alley into a rough wooden shed where they yanked the sacking off their prisoner. The soldam darted for the door, but they caught her in the first step. She was not weak, yet they were three. And when they were done, the soldam was stripped to her shift and bound hand and foot with stout cord. Men eyed the lightning panel dress and soft boots they had laid out. It might fit you, Nynaeve. It won't fit Elaine or me. Nynaeve hurriedly removed her own clothes. She tossed them aside and donned the soldam's dress. Min helped with the buttons. Snatching up the bracelet, Nynaeve took a deep breath and closed it around her left wrist. Get the dress, Elaine. They had dyed a pair of dresses, one of hers and one of Elaine's, to the gray that the Damani wore. Elaine did not move except to stare at the open collar and lick her lips. Elaine, you have to wear it. I know, Elaine sighed. I just wish I knew more of what it does to you. There's one way to find out, Nynaeve said. With only a moment of hesitation snapped it around the neck of the soldam, Nynaeve addressed the bound woman. It won't hurt you if you answer my questions truthfully. We aren't Sianchon, but if you lie to me, she lifted the leash threateningly. The woman's shoulders shook, and her mouth curled around the gag in a sneer. It took nine of a moment to realize the soldan was laughing. Her mouth tightened, but then a thought came to her. That bundle of sensation inside her seemed to be everything physical that the other woman felt. Experimentally, she tried adding to it. Eyes bulging out of her head, the soldan gave a cry that the gag only partially stopped, Fanning her hands behind her as if trying to ward off something, she humped through the straw in a vain effort to escape. Nine of gaped, and hastily rid herself of the extra feelings she had added. The soldam sagged, weeping. Min said, But it isn't supposed to work that way. They always claimed it won't work on any woman who can't channel. Nine of said, I do not care how it is supposed to work so long as it does. Nynaeve seized the silver metal leash and pulled the woman up long enough to look in her eyes. Frightened eyes, she saw. You listen to me and listen well. I want answers, and if I don't get them, I'll make you think I've had the hide off you. What is your name? Seta, please. I'll answer you, but please take it off. Nynaeve realized something. She could never make Elaine wear that collar. Put your own clothes back on, Elaine. We have somebody to be our least one. Nine of tugged at the leash that held Sita, and the soldam gasped. Nine of sighed. We are going where all the Damani are kept, and we intend to free one of them. Sita was still gaping in astonishment when they hustled her out of the shed. Rand held his cloak closed with one hand as he neared the town. The first shadows of morning stretched out ahead of him. He could just see Huron riding among the wagon yards and horse lots. Only one or two men moved along the lines of merchant wagons, and they wore long aprons of wheelwrights or blacksmiths. Ingtar, the first in, was already out of sight. Perrin and Matt followed behind Rand at spaced intervals. He did not look back to check on them. There was not supposed to be anything to connect them. Five men coming into Falme at an early hour, but not together. Rand dismounted alongside Ingtar's stallion and hesitated over his saddlebags. He had not been able to leave the banner behind. Still, it made him uneasy to have it with him. He decided to leave the saddlebags tied behind his saddle. Matt joined them, and a few moments later Huron came with Perrin. Rand thought they all looked like villainous beggars, but they had all passed largely unnoticed in the villages. Now, Ingtard said, let us see what we see. They strolled out to the dirt street as if they had no particular destination in mind. They walked in a bunch, but it was Hurin who led them, sniffing the air and turning up this street and down that. Hurin muttered, grimacing, his smell is everywhere, and it stinks so it's hard to tell old from new. At least I know he's still here. Some of it cannot be older than a day or two. They rounded a corner, and Ran was taken back by the sight of a score of Sianshan soldiers standing guard in front of a big house on one side of the street, 
and by the sight of two women in lightning-marked dresses talking on the doorsteps of another across from it. A banner flapped in the wind over the house the soldiers protected, a golden hawk clutching lightning bolts. Nothing marked out the house where the women talked except themselves. The officer's armor was resplendent in red and black and gold, his helmet gilded and painted to look like a spider's head. Then Rand saw two big leathery-skinned shapes crouched among the soldiers and missed a step. Grom. There was no mistaking those wedge-shaped heads with their three eyes. They can't be. Perhaps he was really asleep and this was all a nightmare. Maybe we haven't even left for Falmy yet. The others stared at the beast as they walked past the guarded house. What in the name of light are they? Matt asked. Huron's eyes seemed as big as his face. But Lord Ran, there, uh, those are, uh, it doesn't matter, Ran said. After a moment, Huron nodded. We are here for the horn, Ingtar said, not to stare at Sianshan monsters. Concentrate on finding Fane, Hurin. The soldiers barely glanced at them. The street ran straight down to the round harbor. Ran could see ships anchored down there, tall, square-looking ships with high masts, small in that distance. He's been here a lot. Hurin scrubbed at his nose with the back of his hand. The street stinks of layer on layer on layer of him. I think he might have been here as late as yesterday, Lord Ingtar. Maybe last night. Matt suddenly clutched his coat with both hands. It's in there, he whispered. He turned around and walked backwards, peering at the tall house with the banner. The dagger is in there. I didn't even notice it before because of those, those things, but I can feel it. Perrin poked a finger in his ribs. Well, stop that before they start wondering why you're goggling at them like a fool. Rand glanced over his shoulder. The officer was looking after them. Matt turned back around sullenly. Are we just going to keep on walking? It's in there, I tell you. The horn is what we are after, Intar growled. I mean to find Fane and make him tell me where it is. He did not slow down. Matt said nothing, but his entire face was a plea. I have to find Fane, too, Rand thought. I have to. But when he looked at Matt's face, he said, Ingtar, if the dagger is in that house, Fane likely is, too. I can't see him letting the dagger or the horn, either one, far out of his sight. Ingtar stopped. After a moment, he said, It could be, but we will never know from out here. We could watch for him to come out, Rand said. If he comes out at this time of the morning, then he spent the night there, and I'll wager where he sleeps is where the horn is. If he does come out, we can be back to Varen by midday and have a plan made before nightfall. I do not mean to wait for Varen, Inkar said, and neither will I wait for night. I've waited too long already. I mean to have the horn in my hands before the sun sets again. But we don't know, Inkar. I know the dagger is in there, Matt said. And Hurin says Fane was here last night. Ingtar overrode Hurin's attempts to qualify that. It is the first time you have been willing to say anything closer than a day or two. We are going to take back the horn now. Now! How? Rand said. The officer was no longer watching them. But there were still at least twenty soldiers in front of the building and a pair of Grom. There seem to be gardens behind all these houses, Ingtar said, looking around thoughtfully. If one of those alleys runs by a garden wall, sometimes men are so busy guarding their front, they neglect their back. Come. He headed straight for the nearest narrow passage between two of the tall houses. Hearn and Matt trotted right after him. Rand exchanged looks with Perrin and they followed too. The alley was barely wider than their shoulders, but it ran between high garden walls until it crossed another alley big enough for a push-barrow or small cart. That was cobblestone, too, but only the backs of the buildings looked down on it, shuttered windows and expanses of stone, and the high back walls of gardens overtopped by nearly leafless branches. Ingtar led them along the alley until they were opposite the waving banner. 
Taking his steel-backed gauntlets from under his coat, he put them on and leaped up to catch the top of the wall, then pulled himself up enough to peer over. He reported in a low monotone. Trees, flower beds, walks, a guard, one man. He isn't even wearing his helmet. Follow me. He swung a boot to the top of the wall and rolled over inside, disappearing before Ran could say a word. The garden was in the grip of deep autumn. Flower beds empty except for a few evergreen shrubs, tree branches nearly bare. Rand ran in a crouch, conscious of the windows blankly peering down from the house. It was a relief to press himself against the house beside Ingtar. Matt kept muttering to himself, It's in there. I can feel it. Where's the guard? Rand whispered. Dead, Ingtar said. Ran drew his sword as they started up the back steps. The hallway inside was narrow. A half-open door to their right smelled like a kitchen. Several people were moving about in that room. There was an indistinguishable sound of voices and occasionally the soft clatter of a pot lid. Ingtar motioned to Matt to lead, and they crept by the door. Rand watched the narrowing opening until they were around the next corner. Matt pointed to a narrow set of winding stairs. They climbed a flight, and he led them toward the front of the house. The furnishings in the hallways were sparse and seemed all curves. All around them, Rand could hear the sounds of people stirring, slippers scuffing on the floor, soft murmurs of speech. In there, Matt whispered, pointing to a big pair of sliding doors ahead, carved handholds, their only ornamentation. At least... The dagger is. Ingtar looked at Hurin. The sniffer slid the doors open, and Ingtar leaped through with his sword ready. There was no one there, and Rand and the others hurried inside, and Hurin quickly closed the doors behind them. Painted screens hid all the walls and any other doors, and veiled the light coming through the windows that had to overlook the street. At one end of the big room stood a tall, circular cabinet. At the other was a small table. The lone chair on the carpet turned to face it. Rand heard Ingtar gasp, but he only felt like heaving a sigh of relief. The curling golden horn of Valir sat on a stand on the table. Below it, the ruby in the hilt of the ornate dagger caught the light. Matt darted to the table, snatching the horn and dagger. We have it, he crowed, shaking the dagger in his fist. We have both of them. Not so loud, Perrin said with a wince. We don't have them out of here yet. His hands were busy on the haft of his axe. The Horn of Elir. There was sheer awe in Ingtar's voice. It is. By the light it is. I am saved. Hurin moved the screens that hid the windows and peered into the street below. Those soldiers are all still there. Rand went to join him. As he lifted his eyes from the street, words died. He was looking over a wall into the garden of the big house across the street. He could see where further walls had been torn down, joining other gardens to it. Women sat on benches there or strolled along the walks, always in pairs. Women linked, neck to wrist, by silver leashes. One of the women with a collar around her neck looked up, the blood drained from Rand's face. Egwene! Matt said, What are you talking about? Egwene is safe in Tarvalin. She's here, Rand said, right across the street. Oh, light! She's wearing one of those collars. I have to get her out. The rest of you... So! The slurring voice was as soft as the sound of doors sliding in their tracks. You're not who I expected. For a brief moment, Rand stared. The tall man with the shaven head who had stepped into the room wore a long, trailing blue robe, and his fingernails were so long that Rand wondered if he could handle anything. The two men standing obsequiously behind him had only half their dark hair shaved, the rest hanging in a dark braid down each man's right cheek. One of them cradled a sheathed sword in his arms. It was only a moment he had for staring, 
then screens topple to reveal at either end of the room a doorway crowded with five Sianshan soldiers, bareheaded but armored and swords in hand. You are in the presence of the High Lord Turak, said the man who carried the sword. When one of my guards was found dead, Turok said calmly, I suspected the man who calls himself Fane. I have been suspicious of him. He has always wanted that dagger, and now to find strangers with not only the dagger but the horn, it will please me to kill one or two of you for disturbing my mourning. Those who survive will tell me of who you are and why you came. At this, Ingtar leaped at the soldiers and hurried after him. As the soldiers fell back before them, ran faced Turok, who held his blade upright before him. The void enveloped Rand. Side in flowed. Turok's eyes widened as Rand glided forward. He dropped to one knee, blade slashing across. He did not need Turok's gasp or the feel of resistance to know. Turok's eyes were still open, but already filmed with death. Around Rand was nothing but death. Hurin looked at Matt, who was breathing heavily. Ingtar said, We have what we came for, now we are leaving as fast as we can run. They crossed the garden at a dead run, climbing over rapidly. Shouts rose from the house they had just left. A woman screamed, and someone began tolling a gong. I will come back for her. Somehow. Rand then sped after the others as fast as he could. Nine of the others heard distant shouts as they approached the buildings where the Damani were housed. The crowds were beginning to pick up, and there was a nervousness to the people in the street. Elaine peered toward the shouts, one street over. What is happening? Nothing to do with us, Nynev said firmly. She increased her pace, hurrying up the steps ahead of the others, and disappeared inside the tall stone house. Nynev shortened her grip on the leash. Remember, Sita. You want us to make it through this safely as much as we do. I do, the Ascienchon woman said fervently. She kept her chin on her chest to hide her face. I will cause you no trouble, I swear. As they turned up the grey stone steps, a Suldam and Damani appeared at the head of the stairs, coming down as they went up. After one glance to make sure the woman in the collar was not Egwene, Nynaeve did not look at them again. She pushed open the door and they went in. Whatever the excitement beneath Turak's banner, it did not extend here. Not yet. There were only women moving about in the entry hall, all easily placed by their dress. Three grey-dressed Amani with Suldam wearing the bracelets. Near the back of the house, Min took a narrow stairs that spiraled upwards. Nynev pushed Sita up it ahead of her, all the way to the fourth floor. The ceilings were low there, the halls empty and silent except for the soft sounds of weeping. Weeping seemed to fit the air of the chilly halls. This place, Elaine began, then shook her head. It feels... Yes, it does, Nynaeve said grimly. She glared at Sita, who kept her face down. A pallor of fear made the Sianchon woman's skin paler than it was normally. Wordlessly, Min opened a door and went in, and they followed. A slender, dark-haired girl in gray sat at a small table with her head resting on folded arms. But even before she looked up, Nynev knew it was Egwene. A ribbon of shining metal ran from the silver collar around Egwene's neck to a bracelet hanging on a peg on the wall. Her eyes widened at the sight of them, her mouth working silently. As Elaine closed the door, Egwene gave a sudden giggle and pressed her hands to her mouth to stifle it. The tiny room was more than crowded with all of them in it. "'Where did you come from?' she said in a quivering voice. "'How did you do it? That dress?' She gave an abrupt squeak. "'That's Sita!' Her voice hardened so that nine have barely recognized it. I'd like to put her in a pot of boiling water. Sita had her eyes squeezed shut, and her hands clutched her skirts. She was trembling. Egwene never took her eyes off the Sianchon woman. You do not know what it is like wearing one of these, Elaine. 
You don't know what they can do to you. Can you take this off me? Nine have channeled. A pinpoint trickle. The collar sprang open and fell away from Egwene's throat. With an expression of wonder, Egwene touched her neck. Put on my dress and coat, Nine have told her. Elaine was already unbundling the clothes on the bed. We will walk out of here and no one will even notice you. And no one did pay any more attention to them going out than they had coming in. Nine have supposed she'd had the sole damn dress to thank for that, but she could not wait to change into something else, anything else. The dirtiest rag would feel cleaner on her skin. The girls were silent, walking close behind her until they were out on the cobblestone street again. Egwene said, We will need horses. I know the stable where they took my horse, Bella, but I don't think we can get to her. We have to leave Bella here, Nine have told her. We are leaving by ship. Where is everybody, Min said, and suddenly Nine have realized the street was empty. But up the street from the harbor came a formation of Sianchon soldiers, a hundred or more in ordered ranks, with an officer at their head in his painted armor. They were still halfway down the street from the women, but they marched with a grim, implacable step, and it seemed to Nynaeve that every eye was fixed on her. There are more behind us, Min murmured. Nynaeve could hear those boots now. I don't know which will reach us first. Nynaeve took a deep breath. They're nothing to do with us. She looked beyond the approaching soldiers to the harbor filled with tall, boxy, Sianchon ships. We will walk right past them. With a roar like thunder, the street under the first ranks of Sianchon erupted, dirt and cobblestones and armored men thrown aside like spray from a fountain. Still glowing with the one power, Egwene spun to stare up the street, and the thunderous roar was repeated. Dirt rained down on the women. Shouting Sianchon soldiers scattered to shelter in alleys and behind stoops. In moments they were all out of sight except for those who lay around the two large holes marring the street. Some of those stirred feebly and moans drifted along the street. Look out! Min shouted. With a shrill whine, a fireball as big as a horse arched into the air over the rooftops and began to fall directly toward them. Run! Nynaeve shouted, and threw herself into a dive toward the nearest alleyway between two shuttered shops. She landed awkwardly on her stomach with a grunt, losing half her breath as the fireball struck. Hot wind washed over her down the narrow passage. Gulping air, she rolled onto her back and stared back into the street. The cobblestones where they had been standing were chipped and cracked and blackened into a circle ten paces across. Elaine was crouched just inside another alleyway on the other side of the street. Of Min and Egwene, there was no sign. Nine have clapped a hand to her mouth in horror. Elaine seemed to understand what she was thinking. The daughter heir shook her head violently and pointed down the street. They had gone that way. Nine have heaved a sigh of relief. She scooted to the corner and peered cautiously around the edge of the building. A head-sized fireball flashed down the street toward her. She leaped back just before it exploded against the corner where her own head had been. Anger had her awash in the one power before she was aware of it. Lightning flashed out of the sky, striking somewhere up the street with a crash near the origin of the fireball. Another jagged bolt split the sky, and then she was running down the alley. Behind her, lightning lanced the mouth of the alley. Geoffrey Bornhold eyed the lightning flashing over Falme and dismissed it from his mind. Some huge flying creature, one of the Sianchon monsters, no doubt, flew wildly to escape the bolts. If there was a storm, it would hinder the Sianchon as much as it did him. Nearly treeless hills, a few topped by sparse thickets, still hid the town from him and him from it. His thousand men lay spread out to either side of him, one long mounted rank rippling along the hollows between hills. The cold wind tossed their white cloaks and flapped the banner at Bornhald's side. The wavy rayed golden son of the children of the light. He raised his voice. The legion will advance at a walk. With a creak of saddles, the long line of white cloaked men moved slowly toward Falme. Rand peered around the corner at the approaching Sianchon, then ducked back into the narrow alley between the two stables with a grimace. They would be there soon. 
Lightning flashed across the sky again. He felt the rumble of it plummet through his boots. What in the name of light is happening? Matt and Perrin and Huron were down at the other end of the alley watching the other Sianchon patrol. The place where they had left the horses was close now, and they could only reach it. She's in trouble, Rand muttered. Egwene. There was an odd feeling in his head as if pieces of his life were in danger. Egwene was one piece, one thread of the cord that made his life, but there were others, and he could feel them threatened. Down there, in Falme. And if any of those threads was destroyed, his life would never be complete, the way it was meant to be. He did not understand, but the feeling was sure and certain. One man could hold fifty here, Ingtar said. The two stables stood close together, with barely room for the pair of them to stand side by side between them. One man holding fifty at a narrow passage. Not a bad way to die. Songs have been made about less. There's no need for that, Rand said. I hope. A rooftop in the town exploded. How am I going to get back in there? I have to reach her. Shaking his head, he peeked around the corner again. The Sianchon were closer, still coming. I never knew what he was going to do, Ingtar said softly, as if talking to himself. He had his sword out, testing the edge with his thumb. A pale little man you didn't seem to really notice even when you were looking at him. Take him inside Faldara, I was told, inside the fortress. I did not want to, but I had to do it. You understand? I had to. I never knew what he intended until he shot that arrow. I still don't know if it was meant for the Amrillin or for you. Rand felt a chill. He stared at Ingtar. What are you saying? Studying his blade, Ingtar did not seem to hear. Humankind is being swept away everywhere. Nations fall and vanish. Dark friends are everywhere, and none of these Southlanders seem to notice or care. We fight to hold the borderlands, to keep them safe in their houses, and every year, despite all we can do, the blight advances. He frowned and shook his head. It seemed the only way. We would be destroyed for nothing, defending people who do not even know or care. It seemed logical. Why should we be destroyed for them when we could make our own peace? Better the shadow, I thought, than useless oblivion. It seemed so logical. Then... Rand grabbed Ingtar's lapels. You aren't making any sense. Say it plain, whatever you mean. You're talking crazy. For the first time, Ingtar looked at Rand. His eyes shone with unshed tears. You are a better man than I, shepherd or lord. A better man. The prophecy says, Let who sounds the horn think not of glory, but only of salvation. It was my salvation I was thinking of. I would sound the horn and lead the heroes of the ages against Shaogul. Surely that would have been enough to save me? No man can walk so long in the shadow that he cannot come again to the light. That's what they say. Surely that would have been enough to wash away what I have been and done. Oh, light, Ingtar! Rand released his hold on the other man and sagged back against the stable wall. I think... I think wanting to is enough. I think all you have to do is stop being... one of them... Ingtar flinched as if Rand had said it out. Dark friend. Rand, I tried to escape what I'd become, but I never did. Always, there was something else required of me. Rand did not know what to say. Too horrible for anyone to admit, unless it was true. Too horrible. After a time, Ingtar spoke again firmly. There has to be a price, Rand. There is always a price. Perhaps I can pay it here. Before Rand could say anything, Hurin came running down the alley. He said, The patrol turned aside, down into the town. They seemed to be gathering down there. Matt and Perrin went on. We'd better do the same. Those bug-headed Sianchon are almost there. Go, Rand, Ingtar said. He turned to face the street and did not look at Rand or Hurin again. Take the horn where it belongs. I always knew the Amrillans should have given you the charge. But all I ever wanted was to keep Shinar whole, to keep us from being swept away and forgotten. I know, Ingtar. Rand drew a deep breath. 
The light shine on you, Lord Ingtar, house of Shinor, and may you shelter in the palm of the Creator's hand. He touched Ingtar's shoulder. The last embrace of the mother welcome you home. Thank you, Ingtar said softly. Rand could hear the steady tread of the Sianchon's boots now. He did not look back. When they reached their horses, Rand said, You three take the horn to Varen Sadai. I have to go back. Now, Egwene is still there, remember? With one of those collars around her neck. Are you sure, Mad said? I never saw her. Ah, if you say she's there, then she's there. Look, we'll all take the horn to Varen, and then we'll all go back for her. You don't think I would leave her there, do you? Matt, Varen must take you and that dagger to Tarvalon so you can finally be free of it. You don't have any time to waste. Saving Egwene isn't wasting time. Matt's hand tightened on the dagger till it shook. We aren't any of us going back, Perrin said. Not yet. Look. He pointed back toward Falme. The wagon yards and horse lots were turning black with Sionchon's soldiers. Thousands of them, rank on rank, with troops of cavalry riding scaled beasts as well as armored men on horses, colorful gaunt fanons marking the officers. Grom darted the ranks. At intervals along the line stood Suldam and Damani by the score. Ran wondered if Egwene were one of them. In the town behind the soldiers a rooftop still exploded now and again, and lightning still streaked the sky. Two flying beasts with leathery wings, twenty spans tip to tip, soared high overhead, keeping well away from where the bright bolts danced. "'All that for us?' Matt said incredulously. "'Who do they think we are?' "'We aren't going the other way either, Lord Rand,' Hurin said. "'White cloaks. Hundreds of them.' Rand wheeled his horse to look where the sniffer was pointing. A long, white-cloaked line rippled slowly toward them across the hills. "'Lord Rand,' Hurin muttered, "'if that lot lays an eye on the Horn of Valir, "'we'll never get it close to an Aes Sedai. "'We'll never get close to it again ourselves.' "'Maybe that's why the Sianchon are gathering,' Matt said hopefully, "'because of the white cloaks. "'Maybe it doesn't have anything to do with us at all.' "'Whether it does or not,' Perrin said dryly, "'there's going to be a battle here in a few minutes.' Either side could kill us, Hearn said, even if they never see the horn. Rand could not manage to think about the white cloaks or the Sionchon. I have to go back. I have to. He was staring at the horn of Valir. He realized they all were. The curled golden horn hung at Matt's pommel, the focus of every eye. It has to be there at the last battle, Matt said, licking his lips. Nothing says it can't be used before, then. He pulled the horn free of its lashings and looked at them anxiously. Nothing says it can't. Matt's hand shook as he raised the horn of Valir to his lips. It was a clear note, golden as the horn was golden. The trees around them seemed to resonate with it in the ground under their feet, the sky overhead. That one long sound encompassed everything. Out of nowhere a fog began to rise, first thin wisps hanging in the air, then thicker billows and thicker until it blanketed the land like clouds. Geoffram Bornhold stiffened in his saddle as a sound filled the air so sweet he wanted to laugh, so mournful he wanted to cry. It seemed to come from every direction at once. A mist began to rise, growing even as he watched. The Sion Shon, they're trying something. They know we're here. It was too soon, the town too far, but he drew his sword. A clatter of scabbards ran down the rank of his half-legion. He called. The legion will advance at a trot. The fog covered everything now, but he knew Falme was still there ahead. The pace of the horses picked up. He could not see them, but he could hear. Abruptly the ground ahead flew up with a roar, showering him with dirt and pebbles. From the white blindness to his right he heard another roar, and men and horses screamed, then from his left, and again, again, thunder and screams hidden by the fog. The legion will charge! His horse leaped forward as he dug in his heels, and he heard the roars of the legion as much of it as still lived followed. Thunder and screams wrapped in whiteness. 
Rand could not see the trees around them any longer. The fog hid everything, yet Rand could see. He could see, but it was mad. Falme floated somewhere beneath him, its landward border black with the Sienchon ranks, lightning ripping its streets. Falme hung over his head. Their white cloaks charged and died as the earth opened in fire beneath their horses' hooves. Hurin anxious, Matt muttering fearful, Perrin looking as if he knew this was meant to be. The fog roiled up all around them. Hurin gasped. Lord Ran! There was no need for him to point. Down the billowing fog, as if it were the side of a mountain, rode shapes on horses. It was Ran's turn to gasp. He knew them. Men, not all in armor, and women. Their clothes and their weapons came from every age, but he knew them all. Rogosh Eagle Eye, a fatherly-looking man with white hair and eyes so sharp as to make his name merely a hint. Gaidal Cain, a swarthy man with the hilts of his two swords sticking above his broad shoulders. Golden-haired Burgit, with her gleaming silver bow and quiver bristling with silver arrows. More. He knew their faces, knew their names. He knew the man who rode at their head, too. Tall and hook-nosed, with dark, deep-set eyes, his great sword justice at his side. Autur Hawkwing. It takes more than bravery to bind a man to the horn. Autur Hawkwing's voice was deep and carrying, a voice used to giving commands. Or a woman, Burjit said sharply. Or a woman, Hawkwing agreed. Only a few are bound to the wheel, spun out again and again to work the will of the wheel in the pattern of the ages. You could tell him, Luz Theron, could you but remember when you wore flesh. He was looking at Rand. Rand shook his head, but he could not waste time with denials. Rand said, Invaders have come, men who call themselves Sion Shan, who use chained Aesadai in battle. They must be driven back into the sea, and there is a girl, Egwene Alvir, a novice from the White Tower. The Sion Shan have her prisoner. You must help me free her. To his surprise, several of the small hosts behind Arthur Hawkwing chuckled, and Burgit, testing her bowstring, laughed. You always choose women who cause you trouble, Luce Theron. It had a fond sound as between old friends. My name is Randall Thor, he snapped. You have to hurry, there isn't much time. Time? Burgit said, smiling. We have all of time. Gaidal Kane dropped his reins, and guiding his horse with his knees, drew a sword in either hand. Along the small band of heroes there was an unsheathing of swords, an unlimbering of bows, and a hefting of spears and axes. Justice shone like a mirror in Arthur Hawkwing's gauntleted fist. I have fought by your side times beyond number, Luce Theron, and faced you as many more. The wheel spends us out for its purposes, not ours, to serve the pattern. I know you if you do not know yourself. We will drive these invaders out for you. His war-horse pranced, and he looked around, frowning. Something is wrong here. Something holds me. Suddenly he turned his sharp-eyed gaze on Rand. You are here. Have you the banner? A murmur ran through those behind him. Yes. Rand tore open the straps of his saddlebags and pulled out the dragon's banner. It filled his hands and hung almost to his stallion's knees. The murmurs among the heroes rose. Burn me, Matt breathed. It's true. Burn me. Perrin hesitated only an instant before swinging down off his horse and striding into the mist. There came a chopping sound, and when he returned, he carried a straight length of sapling shorn of its branches. Give it to me, Rand, he said gravely. Hastily, Rand helped him tie the banner to the pole. When Perrin remounted, pole in hand, a current of air seemed to ripple the pale length of the banner, so the serpentine dragon appeared to move alive. The wind did not touch the heavy fog, only the banner. Hawkwing bowed formally from his saddle to Rand. With your permission, Lord Rand. Trumpeter, will you give us music on the horn? Fitting that the horn of Elia should sing us into battle. Bannerman! Will you advance? 
Matt sounded the horn again, long and high. The mists rang with it, and Perrin heeled his horse forward. Ran drew the heron mark blade and rode between them. He could see nothing but thick billows of white. The wild cries Matt wrung from the horn echoed in the fog, and the drumming of hooves as the horses picked up speed. Ran charged into the mists, wondering if he knew where he was headed. Suddenly bows and moaners before him in the mists, throwing his arms wide. Red reared wildly, hurling Ran from his saddle. When he climbed to his feet, his horse was gone, but Balzamon was still there. Rand went forward to meet Balzamon. Reluctantly, he assumed the void. Reach for the true source was filled with the one power. Get out of my way, he grated. I'm not here for you. The girl? Balzamon laughed. His mouth turned to flame. You are mine, Luce Theron. Oh, you are dead. Rand snarled. He struck at Balzamon, but his blade was turned into a shower of sparks. Father of lies! The fires of Balzamon's face roared with laughter. Rand said, I have business in Falmer, none with you, never with you. I have to hold his attention until they can free Egwene. In that odd way he could see the battle rage among the fog-shrouded wagon yards and horse lots. You pitiful wretch. You have sounded the horn of Valir. You are linked to it now. Do you think the worms of the White Tower will ever release you? They'll put chains around your neck so heavy you'll never cut them. At the edge of his awareness, Rand saw the Sionchon falling back in the streets of Farme, fighting desperately. Damani tore the earth with the one power, but it could not harm Artur Hawkwing nor the other heroes of the Horn. Will you remain a slug beneath a rock? Bows among snarled. The darkness behind him boiled and stirred. You kill yourself while we stand here. The power rages in you. It burns in you. It is killing you. I alone in all the world can teach you how to control it. Serve me and live. Serve me or die. Never. He launched himself at Balsamon again. Balsamon caught his blow, and he had to leap away before the staff split his head. They will not save you, Balsamon said. Those who might save you will be carried far across the Arith Ocean. If ever you see them again, they will be colored slaves, and they will destroy you for their new masters. Egwene, I can't let them do that to her. He shifted his sword and Balsamon readied his staff. For the first time, Rand realized that Balsamon acted as if the heron mark blade could harm him. Steel can't hurt the Dark One. But Balsamon watched the sword warily. Rand was one with the sword. He could feel every particle of it. He could feel the power that suffused him running into the sword. Balsamon stared at him. Why are you grinning like an idiot fool? Do you not know I can destroy you utterly? Rand felt a calmness beyond that of the void. I will never serve you, father of lies. In a thousand lives I never have. I know that. I am sure of it. Come. It is time to die. Baalzman's eyes widened. For an instant they were furnaces that put sweat on Rand's face. The blackness behind Baalzman boiled up around him and his face hardened. Then die, worm! He struck with the staff as a spear. Rand screamed as he felt it pierce his side, burning like a white-hot poker. The void trembled, but he held on with the last of his strength and drove the heron mark blade into Balsamon's heart. Balsamon screamed, and the dark behind him screamed. The world exploded into fire. Min struggled up the cobblestone street, pushing through crowds searching for the faces of Egwene or Elaine or Nynaeve. In front of one of the tall stone buildings she stopped uncertainly, ignoring the people who brushed past her as if stunned. It was in there, somewhere, that she had to go. She rushed up the stairs and pushed open the door. 
She went on through the house into the garden behind, and there he was. Rand lay sprawled on his back under an oak, face pale and eyes closed. His left hand gripped a hilt that ended in a foot of blade that appeared to have been melted at the end. His chest rose and fell too slowly, and not with the regular rhythm of someone breathing normally. A hasty examination showed that most of his cuts and bruises were not new, at least. The blood had had time to dry into a crust, and the bruises had started to turn yellow at the edges, but there was a hole burned through his coat on the left side. Opening his coat, she pulled up his shirt. Breath whistled through her teeth. There was a wound burned into his side, but it had cauterized itself. What shook her was the feel of his flesh. It had the touch of ice in it. He made the air seem warm. Grabbing his shoulders, she began to drag him toward the house. It was no small task getting him into the room, or up into the bed, but she managed it with only a little hard breathing and covered him up. After a moment, she stuck a hand under the blankets. She winced and shook her head. The sheets were icy cold. He had no body warmth for the blankets to hold. With a put-upon sigh, she wriggled under the covers beside him. All I can do is to try and give him a little warmth. For a time, she studied his face. I like older men, she told him. I like men with education and wit. I have no interest in farms or sheep or shepherds, especially boy shepherds. With a sigh, she smoothed back the hair from his face. He had silky hair. But then, you aren't a shepherd, are you? Not any more. Light, why did the pattern have to catch me up with you? There was a sound in the hall, and the door opened. Egwene stood there. Min's cheeks colored. I, I, I'm keeping him warm. He is unconscious, and he is as cold as ice. Egwene did not come any further into the room. She said, I felt him pulling at me, needing me. Elaine felt it, too. I thought it must be something to do with what he is, but Nynaeve didn't feel anything. She drew a deep, unsteady breath. Elaine and Nynaeve are getting the horses. The Sianchon left most of their horses behind. Nynaeve says we should go as soon as we can, and Min, you know what he is, don't you now? I know. Min wanted to take her arm from under Rand's head, but she could not make herself move. I think I do, anyway. Uh, whatever he is, he is hurt. I can do nothing for him except keep him warm. Min, you do know that he cannot marry. He isn't safe for any of us, Min. Speak for yourself, Min said. She pulled Rand's face against her breast. You tossed him aside for the White Tower. What should you care if I pick him up? Egwene looked at her for what seemed like a long time. She felt her face growing hotter and wanted to look away, but she could not. I will bring Nynaeve, she said finally, and walked out of the room with her back straight and her head high. Min wanted to call out to go after her, but she lay there as if frozen. Frustrated tears stung her eyes. It's what has to be, I know. I read it in all of them. A loud Min said, Light, I don't want to be part of this. It's all your fault, Rand Althor. Not Rand Althor, said a musical voice from the door. It is loose there in Telamon, the dragon reborn. Min stared. She was the most beautiful woman men had ever seen, with pale, smooth skin and long black hair and eyes as dark as night. Min felt herself bristle. The woman came to stand over the bed. Her movements were so graceful, Min felt a stab of envy. Who are you? Min demanded. The woman looked at her fiercely. I am called Lanfear, girl. Min's mouth was abruptly dry. One of the Forsaken? Lanfear snarled. Loose Theron was and is mine, girl. Tend him well for me until I come for him. And she was gone. Min gaped. One moment she was there, then she was gone. When Rand opened his eyes and turned his head, Min was sitting there on the ground watching him. 
Min, it's you. Where'd you come from? Where are we? She said, We're five days east of Falme now, and you've been asleep all that time. Egwene, did they free her? I don't know what they you mean, but she's free. We freed her ourselves. Nynaeve and Elaine and me. Nynaeve, Elaine, how... You were all in Falme? He struggled to sit up, but she pushed him back down easily. Well, where is she? Gone. They're all gone. Egwene and Nynaeve and Mad and Hearn and Varen. Hearn didn't want to leave you, really. They're on their way to Tarvalon. Egwene and Nynaeve back to their training in the tower, and Mad, for whatever Ace said I have to do about that dagger, they took the Horn of Valyr with them. I can't believe I actually saw it. Bran shook his head. Something told him the pain in his side was important. He could not remember being injured, but it was important. He started to lift his blankets to look, but she slapped his hands away. You can't do any good with that. It isn't healed all the way yet. Varen said I tried healing, but she said it didn't work the way it should. She hesitated, nibbling her lip. Moiraine says Nynaeve must have done something or you wouldn't have lived till we carried you to Varen. But Nynaeve said she was too frightened to light a candle. There's something wrong with your wound. You'll have to wait for it to heal naturally. She seemed troubled. Moiraine is here, he barked a bitter laugh. <laughs> when you said Varen was gone, I thought I was free of Asa die again. I am here, Moiraine said. She appeared, all in blue, as serene as if she stood in the white tower, strolling up to stand over him. Min was frowning at the Aes Sedai. Rand had the odd feeling that she meant to protect him from Warren. I wish you weren't here, he told the Aes Sedai. As far as I'm concerned, you can go back to where you've been hiding and stay there. I have not been hiding, Warren said calmly. I have been doing what I could here on Toman Head and in Falme. It was little enough, though I learned much. Moiraine, you said I could go where I wanted, and I mean to go where you are not. I did not send Varen, Moiraine frowned. She did that on her own. You are of interest to a great many people, Rand. Did Fane find you, or you him? The sudden change of topic took him by surprise. Fane? No. A fine hero I make. I tried to rescue Egwene, and Min did it before me. And I never laid eyes on Fane. Did he go with the Sianchon too? Moiraine shook her head. I do not know. I wish I did. But it is as well you did not find him. Not until you know what he is, at least. He's a dark friend. Worse than that. Patton Fane was the Dark One's creature to the depths of his soul. But I believe that in Shadow Logoth he fell afoul of Mordeth who was as vile in fighting the shadow as ever the shadow itself was. Mordeth tried to consume Fane's soul to have a human body again, but he found a soul that had been touched directly by the Dark One. What resulted was neither Patton Fane nor Mordeth, but something far more evil, a blend of the two. Fane, let us call him that, is even more dangerous than you can believe. You might not have survived such a meeting. If he is alive, if he did not go with the Sianchon, I have to... He cut off as she produced his heron mark sword from under her cloak. The blade ended abruptly a foot from the hilt, as if it had been melted. Memory came crashing back. Ran said, I killed him. This time I killed him. Moiraine put the ruined sword aside like the useless thing it now was and wiped her hands together. The Dark One is not slain so easily. The mere fact that he appeared in the sky above Falme is more than merely troubling. He should not be able to do that if he is bound as we believe, and if he is not, why has he not destroyed us all? Min stirred uneasily. In the sky? Rand said in wonder. Both of you, Warren said. Your battle took place across the sky in full view of every soul in Falme. 
Perhaps in other towns on Toman Head, too, if half of what I hear is to be believed. We... we saw it all, Min said in a faint voice. She put a hand over one of Rand's comfortingly. Moiraine reached under her cloak again and came out with a rolled parchment, one of the large sheets such as the street artist in Falme used. The chalks were a little smudged when she unfurled it, but the picture was still clear enough. A man whose face was a solid flame fought with a staff against another with a sword among the clouds where the lightning danced, and behind them rippled the dragon banner. Rand's face was easily recognizable. How many have seen that, he demanded. Tear it up, burn it. The ace of die let the parchment roll back up. It would do no good, Rand. I bought that two days gone in a village we passed through. There are hundreds of them, perhaps thousands, and the tale is being told everywhere of how the dragon battled the dark one in the skies above Farme. Rand looked at Min. She nodded reluctantly and squeezed his hand. She looked frightened, but she did not flinch away. I wonder if that's why Egwene left. She was right to leave. The pattern weaves itself around you even more tightly, Moraine said. You need me now more than ever. I don't need you and I don't want you. I will not have anything to do with this. Light. The dragon is supposed to break the world again, to tear everything apart. I will not be the dragon. You are what you are, Moraine said. Already you stir the world. The Black Gaja has revealed itself for the first time in two thousand years. Arad Doman and Tarabon were on the brink of war, and it will be worse when news of Falme reaches them. Karine is in civil war. Rand frowned as Moiraine went on. There have always been men willing to proclaim for any man who called himself the dragon, but they have never before had such signs as this. There is more. Here. She tossed a pouch on his chest. He hesitated a moment before opening it. Within lay shards of what seemed to be black and white glazed pottery. He had seen their like before. Another seal on the Dark One's prison, he mumbled. Min gasped. Two, Moraine said. Three of the seven seals are broken now. The one I had and two I found in the High Lord's dwelling in Falme. When all seven are broken, perhaps even before, the patchmen put over the hole they drilled into the prison the Creator made will be torn asunder, and the Dark One will once more be able to put his hand through that hole and touch the world. And the only hope of the world is that the Dragon Reborn will be there to face him. I need to walk. Min helped him up. Rand discovered that his chest was wrapped round with bandages. Min draped one of the blankets around his shoulders like a cloak. For a moment, he stood staring down at the heron mark sword, what was left of it, lying on the ground. Tam's sword. My father's sword. Reluctantly, more reluctantly than he had ever done anything in his life, he let go of the hope that he would discover Tam really was his father. Felt as if he were tearing his heart out, but... It did not change the way he felt about Tam, and Emmons Field was the only home he'd ever known. Fane is the important thing. I have one duty left, stopping him. The two women had to support him, one on either arm, down to where the campfires were already burning not far from a road of the hard-packed dirt. Loyal was there, reading a book, and Perrin staring into one of the fires— the Shinarans were making preparations for their evening meal. Lan sat under a tree, sharpening his sword. The warder gave Rand a careful look, then a nod. There was something else, too. The dragon banner rippled on the wind over the middle of the camp. Somewhere they had found a proper staff to replace Perrin's sapling. Rand demanded, What is that doing out where anybody who passes can see it? It is too late to hide, Rand, Moiraine said. It was always too late for you to hide. You don't have to put up a sign saying, Here I am, either. I'll never find Fane if somebody kills me because of that banner. He turned to Loyal and Perrin. I'm glad you stayed. I would have understood if you hadn't. Why would I not stay? Loyal said. 
You are even more Taviran than I believe, true, but you are still my friend. I hope you are still my friend. His ears twitched uncertainly. I am. For as long as it's safe for you to be around me, and even after, too. The augur's grin nearly split his face in two. I'm staying as well, Perrin said. There was a note of resignation or acceptance in his words. The wheel weaves as tight in the pattern, Rand. Who would have thought it, back in Emmons Field? The Shinarans were gathering around. To Rand's surprise, they all fell to their knees. Every one of them watched him. We would pledge ourselves to you, Intgar's soldier Uno said. The others kneeling with him nodded. Your oaths are to Ingar and Lord Agomar, Rand protested. Ingar died well. He died so the rest of us could escape with the horn. There was no need to tell them or anyone else the rest. He hoped that Ingar had found the light again. Tell Lord Agomar that when you return to Faldara. It is said, Uno said carefully, that when the dragon is reborn, he will break all oaths, shatter all ties. Nothing holds us now. We would give our oaths to you. He drew his sword and laid it before him, hilt toward Rand, and the rest of the Shinarans did the same. You must choose, Rand, Moiraine said. The world will be broken whether you break it or not. Taramon Gaidon will come, and that alone will tear the world apart. Will you still try to hide from what you are? and leave the world to face the last battle undefended? Choose. They were all watching him, all waiting. Death is lighter than a feather, duty heavier than a mountain. He made his decision.